Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 17th meeting Break of the control. Economy Committee. Um, and due to ongoing safeguarding measures in place by the government um, in regards to COVID-19, some members will attend the meeting via teleconference, with witnesses also briefing the committee via teleconference. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Um, and just to remind members to mute their tablets, um, pushing F4. Um, item number one then, we have apologies from Stuart. I don't think we have any others. No, everyone else is expected to attend in, in one form or another. Um, item number two then, draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of those at page five of your pack. Are members content that the minutes are an accurate record of the meeting? Agreed. Hmm. Okay, there is no chairperson business, no. so we're moving on then to item number four. Um, is Owen on the line? Owen, are you there? Yes, uh, Owen Reedy and Paul McFlinner here. Thanks. Um, so we have item number four then is our briefing from ICTU on the impact of COVID-19. Um, so there is a memo from the clerk at page 13 of your pack and I'd like to welcome Owen Reedy, the Assistant General Secretary of ICTU and Paul McFlynn, researcher at um, NERI. Um, if you want to go ahead and make an opening statement and then we'll open it up to questions from members. That, that's great, Chairperson. Thanks very much. I hope you can hear me okay, uh, Owen Reedy here. I'll make the, the brief opening statement on behalf of uh, the ICTU and the Nevin Institute. Uh, first of all, we want to thank the uh, committee for the invitation to, to brief you today. To put our comments in context, uh, ICTU is an all-island trade union federation. Uh, in Northern Ireland, we represent 200,000 workers through about 24 trade unions, and we're the central voice of the, the trade union movement uh, in Northern Ireland and the largest cross-community organisation uh, in Northern Ireland. The Nevin Institute is an independent centre-left economic think tank, again on an all-island basis, with an office in Belfast, and Paul is the, the co-director, and it's a, a, an organisation that is funded by the trade union movement. Um, before COVID-19, we were particularly concerned about the world of work in Northern Ireland, uh, low pay in particular and precarious work. Uh, we did a bit of research with Nevin at the time uh, and we found a couple of startling statistics. One in three workers across the economy, public and private sector, felt that their work was insecure. Four out of every 10 workers across the economy were in atypical work contracts, non-standard contracts. And the largest single employment sector, which is retail, four out of every 10 of those workers were paid below the, the real living wage. And in accommodate food, it's 75% of those workers below the real living wage. So low pay, and precariousness uh, was a problem before the global pandemic, uh, and we think it's obviously going to be exacerbated with the impact of COVID-19. We know, for example, uh, the number of people uh, claiming unemployment benefit has increased by 9% uh, since uh, late April. We're told 62% of firms and businesses in Northern Ireland have applied for the uh, job retention scheme. Uh, a quarter of firms have temporarily ceased trading and, you know, we're very concerned that some of those firms and those workers will just not come back. Uh, and based on UK figures, we estimate around 200,000 odd people, 200,000 odd workers in Northern Ireland are furloughed. Uh, we would suggest as well that the global pandemic has made us think about work. It's made us reflect on who and what are the essential workers and in particular, how we value those workers. And I would suggest we don't value them as well as we should when you look at, say, cleaners in hospital, uh, hospitals, food workers on the front line, and retail workers, uh, to name but a few. And I've mentioned some of them are earning very, very low rates of pay. So we believe we need to look at the future of work. Um, we're delighted that Minister Dodds, the economy minister, set up the Northern Ireland Engagement Forum. Uh, we're a constituent part of it. Um, we see this tripartite arrangement of government, unions and employers, social dialogue like this being a welcome thing. Uh, we've been involved in a number of key papers that we've uh, submitted uh, to the minister and the executive that I know you're aware of because the LRA were with you last week. And we think that having both sides of the labour market in the room uh, is critical. And we want this form to be maintained post the pandemic uh, because we think it's crucial as we come out of the pandemic and reopen the economy uh, that we don't turn back to austerity because it's neither socially acceptable nor economically necessary. Uh, we've produced a paper today uh, across the island entitled No Going Back, where we put forward policy options for both jurisdictions. We 
think government now needs to borrow. Interest rates are incredibly low, historically low. But we also need to restructure uh, because what our paper does show is it shows that uh, UK employers pay only 40% of their European peer counterparts when it comes to national insurance, and that needs to change. Final comment I would make, um, we need to challenge low pay. We need to promote collective bargaining. Uh, Paul authored a, a paper that he can talk about in a little while in the Q&A uh, with Nevin recently that showed definitively that workers in Northern Ireland that have collective bargaining in their workplace are on average 13% better off. So we need to promote collective bargaining to challenge low pay. And it is a fundamental vehicle bringing unions and employers together to boost productivity because that's crucial given that we languish low in the productivity leagues. And we need to rebuild our public services um, and to make sure that we value and revalue work in a different way post this pandemic. So thanks very much. That's by way of the opening statement. Um, thank you, Owen. Um, so I guess just to open up then, um, obviously we have here. I think Owen was speaking. Paul, are you, are you making a statement or was Owen speaking on behalf of you both? I think Owen was speaking on yeah. Yeah. Um, apologies. Um, so yeah, the, the committee has heard a great deal about the, the engagement forum that has been set up, um, and I think it's, it's a very positive vehicle to have um, all of the, the players together. Um, and I'd just like to, to explore that a wee bit more with you, um, Owen and Paul, in relation to um, how you think um, it has worked so far and how you think that the, the information that has been provided by the forum is, is being um, taken up by, by the department and um, brought more broadly by, by the exec minister and the executive. Yeah, okay, thanks Chair. With, with the forum, I would say I think what's very good about it is that um, it, it's regrettable it's taken a global pandemic to, to bring social dialogue to Northern Ireland because it's practiced very regularly in Scotland and Wales and we should look at Scotland and Wales as good examples. But I think what it's done is it's, it's brought together a diverse group of people that represent both sides of the labour market, the, the business groups and the trade union movement, along with some key state agencies, PHA, HSCNI uh, and others. And I think skillfully chaired by the LRA because obviously they have a relationship with business and with unions given their important role. And I think it's important that we have the two junior ministers from the executive office on there as a linkage to the Northern Ireland executive. Um, so we've done three pieces of work. Uh, the priority list uh, of essential businesses, uh, and that was published and accepted broadly by the executive. Uh, we did a, a safety document about a month ago, three, three weeks ago, um, basically arguing that this is the minimum required uh, for businesses to operate and as businesses come back as we reopen the economy over the next number of weeks and months because that's very important we need to come back safely and we're, we're happy to see that the minister and the executive endorsed that document in full um, we then did a third piece of work uh, staying safe reopening the Northern Ireland economy which was our uh, suggestion that should be considered uh, in any paper that the executive would publish on you know, the next stages, and it seems that very few of those ideas were were, were, were characterised in the executive paper, and, and I, I'm loath to criticise uh, the executive, particularly given that it's a five-party and voluntary coalition. When you get five parties around the table agreeing on something, that is something to be welcomed, but we believe, uh, the forum believed, and, and the trade union movement believed that, that the paper that was issued two weeks ago was a missed opportunity. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't what it should be. But I do believe uh, it's an advisory forum. Um, politicians have an electoral mandate. We don't. Our job is to give our view, and it's a matter for the politicians to accept or reject, and that's fine. But I do think as the pandemic uh, hopefully eases, and as we come out, and as we have to rebuild our economy, having a forum like this, albeit maybe reconstituted, uh, and maybe having the likes of Invest NI involved as well, is crucial to deal with the issues that are going to challenge us uh, over the next period. And I think it's a worthwhile vehicle. It happens in most progressive liberal democracies, and, and, and why shouldn't it happen in Northern Ireland? And, and um, we're very happy to play our part in it. We don't agree on everything. You couldn't expect us to when you have two sides of the labour market, but it does build relationships. Uh, and for example, I, I won't hog this, but I'll give you one example. The crisis in the meat industry uh, on, on outbreaks and clusters we were able to use the forum where Unite, who are the main union of that industry, was able to bring its concerns centre stage 
to HSC and I and to government. And we found that after doing that, within a week, um, there was a lot more proactivity from HSC and I in those meat plants. And that's a, that's a byproduct of, of an engagement like this where, where, where we can get things done effectively. We would all agree in relation to that that the, the collaborative working is a, a really important piece um, and, and I'm sure members will come back to some of what you have said there Owen um, as well. Um, I just wanted to pick up in relation to some of the, the comments around the number of, of workers who have been furloughed and the, the kind of unemployment rate that we've already seen uh, and I was just wondering if you could maybe expand a wee bit more on the potential scale of unemployment in the time ahead or how you understand that, um, that 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 is kind of being played out, uh, and the role of the the job retention scheme, um, and what is needed in relation to that to, to prevent, I suppose, um, like high levels of unemployment in the months ahead. Yep, we'll do it, chair. And I might make a brief comment, chair, and then I might pass over to Paul to make a brief comment if that's okay. Um, in many ways, I have to say, we very much welcomed the Chancellor's uh, approach. Um, uh, it was a breath of fresh air, and you know, you'd be probably surprised to hear me as a trade unionist to, to, to acknowledge that, but it was a very important initiative uh, that he came out with. Further, further to negotiations with the CDI and the TUC, which I think is, is beneficial. Um, and that job retention scheme at £2,500 uh, per month, 80% of, of the salary, uh, was crucial for Northern Ireland in particular because our median rate of pay is lower than the rest of the UK. For us, it's about £1,600 a month. Uh, in the rest of the UK, it's about £2,500 a month. So I think that was crucial uh, for workers here in, in Northern Ireland. But I think what it also shows is it highlights uh, that even the Tory government accept that the, uni the system of universal credit and unemployment benefit is, is far, far uh, too inferior for what it needs to be, and it's not fit for purpose, um, given the fact that the UK government has reduced the scheme and many countries across Europe and indeed the world have introduced similar uh, type schemes. So it was crucial. Uh, obviously, you can see when you look at the economy that it's hit different areas disproportionately, uh, accommodation in particular um, and, 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 and manufacturing and other sectors. But we would argue it is vital um, that there is no cliff edge uh, and we welcome the fact that it's going to be extended in one form or another to October and that any tapering off of it needs to be harmonised with a gradual reopening of the economy. We also wanted to see more flexibility in it and we argued for that through the forum that it should facilitate short time working because it, it shouldn't be a case of an employer has to furlough a certain amount of staff if they can reach an agreement uh, with the union, if there's a union, or with the workers, if there isn't a union, to, to do short-time working, um, we think that would be useful because the employer can pay workers through short-time working, and then the scheme could top, top up people's pay because it's really crucial to keep that relationship. Um, and I would say to you, you know, these 200,000 workers have not been made unemployed. They have been laid off, and there's a crucial difference. We don't want them to ever become unemployed. We need to keep that and maintain that employment relationship with the employer, uh, so that hopefully, as the economy opens, uh, these workers can come back to work. But I might uh, hand over to Paul, Chair, if that's okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, just to say, just oh. to add to, to what to, to what uh, Owen has said there, uh, in terms of the unemployment figures, um, we've we've obviously already seen in the latest claiming count statistics uh, a doubling uh, of the number of people claiming unemployment benefit. Now, we don't have any official uh, figures uh, for Northern Ireland in terms of the furlough uh, scheme, so we've had to, to estimate it based on uh, Northern Ireland's share of a UK total and based on indicative figures we have from the UK of the number of uh, or the percentage or proportion of workforce uh, that is being furloughed in different sectors uh, and based on, uh, on the sectoral breakdown of the Northern Ireland economy, uh, we think it's, it's probably just shy of about 200,000 uh, workers. Um, what, what, we, what we probably need to concentrate in the immediate term is that there is going to be this, um, to, to borrow a phrase, a, a second spike or a second wave of, of unemployment that's going to come if and when the, uh, the furlough scheme ends. We will not know sort of uh, uh, what the scale of that is going to be until we know what the, what the uh, public health advice is going to be for particular industries 
um, in the future, particularly in uh, accommodation and food and leisure and other sort of particularly tourism related uh, sectors, there will be simply some of those uh, firms that will not be able to come back um, and some firms that will not have survived uh, the intervening period. And it's worth pointing out that the tourism sector in terms of its employment share is significantly bigger now than it was um, uh, before, uh, at the time uh, back in 2013 um, at, the, uh, at the, the low point of the, of, of, of the last recession um, and it has grown to be, to be, to be 8.2% of, of our employment share now and putting that in context back in 2008 construction was only 5.7% of total employment uh, in Northern Ireland so we are looking at a fairly large sector of employment uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, which has a very, very uh, uncertain uh, future. Um, and we, we do need to be prepared for the fact that a lot of the people who are on that furlough scheme, if there is, uh, if there is not additional supports put in place, will simply uh, fall into the, uh, to, to the unemployment statistics. Um, and we could see a, a significant spike in that, uh, unlike anything we saw back in 2008. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Thank you. That's, uh, I suppose, very worrying um, in terms of, of the sectors that um, are most impacted at the minute. Um, and you mentioned, Owen, in your, your opening comments around, I, I suppose, the practice of, of low pay and precarious work um, that kind of resulted out of the, the previous recession. Um, and obviously, we, we don't want to see any, any exacerbation of that um, coming out of this crisis. Um, in terms of what like practical measures can be done to prevent that, what would be the, the types of suggestions that you would be bringing forward? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, there's a number of things that, that can be looked at. Um, I think the fact that Paul's paper, uh, which can be found on the Devon website about collective bargaining in Northern Ireland, that it shows that when you take uh, everything uh, apart and when you when you look at this scientifically and strip it down that workers who have a trade union at their workplace um, when all else is equal are 13 percent better off I think it shows the way um, obviously uh, we're not suggesting that you know uh, workers should be conscripted to unions but we do think uh, given that employment rights is a devolved matter there is scope here in Northern Ireland to improve the legislative context in which unions work uh, and to improve uh, and make it easier for workers who want a trade union in their workplace to have it. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mandatory trade union recognition route uh, that has a threshold of 20 employees. Uh, now, we know that 97% of firms in Northern Ireland have less than 20 employees. So, you know, we have a kind of a micro SME economy. So that needs to be looked at. A key issue we think as well that would be good would be to promote sectoral collective bargaining. Um, so, for example, w we published a paper last year on, on childcare, uh, and we made the point that there's about 10, 11,000 workers in childcare, but 98% of them are women, uh, and 47% of them earn below the real living wage. And obviously, childcare is a critical piece of infrastructure in getting the economy back. We, we need to take cognizance of the childcare deficit in the in the COVID-19 pandemic because most workers rely on, I think it's 47% of, of people rely on family and grandparents. And obviously that's not an, an, an opportunity right now. So in our paper, we basically argued that we need to have a situation where you can have sectoral collective bargaining, for example, in childcare that takes wages out of competition. So you don't have kind of crashes competing with one another on labor costs uh, and you put in place uh, obviously a professionalization and a career path uh, with gradual improved pay and now you might say well who's going to pay for that well the child care report that we published showed that uh, you know was northern ireland uh, spends more per head than wales scotland and england on child care we, we do it we would suggest the wrong way we do it through tax credits whereas we think we should do it um, on, 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 on the supply side through providing uh, resources and providing funding to childcare providers so that that assists them in paying uh, the, the wages as opposed to through the tax credit system. But sectoral collective bargaining is, is a key issue. I think if you have that, you will have two benefits. Obviously, for our purpose, you will have potential increases in pay. Um, but you have to have it through productivity. Uh, and productivity is everyone's business. Productivity is a, a key issue for trade unions. 
um, you know, you cannot get blood from a stone. The firm has to flourish. The firm has to prosper. Um, and that has to happen through local partnership arrangements between local trade unions and firms at the workplace. But I would suggest, given the nature of the Northern Ireland economy, a sectoral approach uh, would probably be better. And actually, again, in the forum, uh, Northern Ireland Engagement Forum, you know, we're getting to meet with the manufacturing NI, the FSBs, the CBIs, the IODs, the chambers. And it's very helpful because it, it, it builds relationships and it builds trust. So, you know, we cannot go back to saying uh, we have to pay our way out of this crisis and now we have to cut. Um, interest rates are incredibly low, so I think we can, we can borrow. I know these are reserve matters. But certainly within a Northern Ireland context, uh, the economy ministry could look at the legislative framework in which trade unions operate that I think would promote collective bargaining, promote workplace partnership, uh, and increase productivity. And again, I think the engagement forum in, in a different guise should be an important vehicle to try and maybe do a little bit of work on that and make certain recommendations to the minister and, of course, to an important, uh, an important uh, committee like yourselves. That's very helpful. Um, and Owen, you, you've touched on something there that I, I wanted to explore with you um, anyway in relation to childcare. Obviously, um, going to be critical in terms of people's ability to return to work. Um, and um, I'm already being contacted by individuals who, you know, whose employers are trying to encourage them to come back to work, and they obviously have childcare responsibilities. Um, in terms of that, you know, what, what is the, I suppose, rights of the worker in, in that scenario and the rights of the employer in, in that scenario? Because, you know, there is no options in terms of childcare currently for people. No, no, you're right. And I think, I think first of all, people need to be pragmatic. But, but we were struck by the fact that in the executive paper on, on reopening the economy, childcare wasn't mentioned once. Um, schools were mentioned. Uh, and actually, we, we were remiss as well not to have childcare workers down on the on the priority list. We had uh, schools and education workers, and I mean, you know, the reality is, schools are forums for education. They're not they're not creches. They're they're, they're different, and obviously, childcare is, is is early learning as well. Um, so it is a critical piece of social infrastructure. But I think we're going to find out very quickly. It's a critical piece of economic infrastructure because, as I said earlier on. Half of all the parents in Northern Ireland effectively rely on family for childcare. Um, and, and we know through work that Paul's organisation has done uh, that 40% of, of, of all workers uh, have kids in the economy. And of that 40%, 75% of them, uh, or 72% of them, uh, are workers where all of the adults in the household are, are employed. So there's a real deficit there, and there, you know I, I don't have a, a short answer other than I do think the state is going to have to assist childcare provision in the short term, just the way the state is assisting many sectors um, to allow people to go back to work in a way that is done safely. Uh, and, and just in answer to your, your your specific question, I mean if if people don't have adequate childcare provision, and um, you know, quite frankly, they're not going to be able to go back to work in the way that they want to. And, you know, I think workers in Northern Ireland do want to go back to work um, because work isn't just for, it, it, it's not just a, a means of, of, of funding your, your life and your family. It, it has many other benefits as well. Um, but obviously, you have to go back safely. Uh, and I would suggest the safety document that the forum authored that the executive has endorsed needs to be the cornerstone of any return to work um, and any return to the opening up of ch crashes and, ch and childcare facilities, but they are going to need additional help in a way that they haven't needed before, because that 47% of cohort that used the family, that, that's not there because, you know, the people over 60 or 70 are maybe cocooning or in, in a vulnerable position. Um, so, you know, I think employers need to be pragmatic uh, and, and have open conversations with their, with their staff on this. Um, there needs to be risk assessments uh, for people to go back to work, but people need to have the adequate uh, arrangements in place. And you know, I, I, I think if there's a if there's a proper dialogue there uh, and, and a proper mutual respect, we can work our way through it. Uh, I have to say, sadly, uh, the level of trade union density in the childcare sector is about five percent, and so there isn't a huge trade union footprint in it right now. Uh, that's something we'd like to change. 
Um, but I mean, until creches can open safely and they're going to need extra support and resourcing to do that, we're going to have a major problem that's going to hold back the economy as it, as it needs to reopen. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in other members. John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to you both for your presentation and answers commentary thus far. I want to explore uh, further the future of the engagement forum and how it, it can evolve or the need for it perhaps to evolve into a social partnership uh, as we face into a, a very uncertain future, uh, a future which may include austerity, uh, a reduction in public services, a reduction in public spending. Now, no, none of those things have to happen. I'm not arguing for them, but I suspect they're more likely to happen given that those who are in power in, in Westminster are more likely to travel in that direction. And then the executive um, it has a limited budget to spend in terms of its investment programme. Uh, in terms of a model for the future, what do you see that, that, that strategic forum as you spoke earlier about uh, sectoral collective bargaining, uh, would that be the sort of forum that would take place in, or is, is that a different role altogether? Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, um, John. Um, I, I would suggest that um, the forum shouldn't be involved in, in, in bargaining on pay and conditions of employment. I, I don't think it should it should do that because if you look in the public service, for example. Um, some issues are negotiated on a, a UK-wide basis. Uh, others are negotiated locally, for example, in education and the civil service, uh, and other issues there are comparators and comparisons with England, Scotland and Wales. So there are existing arrangements there for that. Uh, and in the private sector, you know, unions where they're organised, they negotiate with their employers. I think the forum, if it's reconstituted, should look at issues like the future of work, you know, low pay, productivity, skills, uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, how we target our state resources in industry and in industrial strategy, uh, you know, things like that. But I also think it, it is an important vehicle to, to, to address kind of serious problems that arise. And I gave one example of the meat industry. Sexual collective bargaining, I would say, for example, if you look at, say, the, the, you know, the, 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 the retail industry, for example, uh, and obviously there's large retailers and small retailers and OSDA would be the main union. And in some cases there are UK wide agreements in other cases there aren't. But we would suggest there should be a role to broaden the scope where, you know, the LRA, for example, would be charged with, uh, on, on, on foot of a request from either employers or trade unions to, to look at an industry uh, and to sit down with the relevant trade union in that industry and to sit down with the relevant employer representatives of that industry and to try and agree minimum conditions of employment, obviously above the current legislative minimums for that industry. Uh, and we have examples like that in other jurisdictions. In, in, in the Republic of Ireland, you have a thing called the Joint Labour Committee System. You have it in contract cleaning and security and retail and a couple of sectors. And what it would do is it would take wages out of competition to a large degree and it means that the issue of labour costs would be broadly uh, similar across the board. So, you know, the, the competitive advantage of a particular firm or a retail outlet would have to be on something else rather than, oh, we, 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 you know, we'll see pay and we'll cut it as the lowest common denominator. Now, we're not talking about, you know, radical increases. And obviously, these things have to be paid. Uh, and, you know, it's the private sector, so it has to be paid for through throughput. But... We think these types of things do work in other jurisdictions. And I give you the example of the Republic of Ireland, where it takes wages out of competition. And I think as well, we only have to look at Wales and Scotland with their social dialogue practices to see how um, we could model the Northern Ireland Engagement Forum post its current purpose. I, I do think, obviously, employers, unions and politicians are, are, are critical to it, the, the state. Uh, and I do think, for example, as we move forward, I would see it as more of as an economic forum. So I, I think maybe the likes of Invest NI as well uh, would be would be a critical uh, participant too. Okay, uh, just to follow up on that, well, um, in, in terms of strategic forum, and, and this is not a reflection on, on yourselves or, or other partners on it, but as a committee, we're trying to glean information about the role of that forum, um, and we hope to have more information on its on on its workings 
uh, and, and its ability to uh, deliver in the weeks ahead. But that's not a reflection on any of the partners within that forum. It's just in terms of processes and sometimes uh, government is slow to uh, release information, but we'll get there eventually. Uh, in terms of, uh, I just want to return then to th th this idea of sectoral collective bargaining, and, and you mentioned the ALRA there. Would that require a change in legislation? How would we ensure, uh, or if it, if it doesn't ensure, require a change in legislation for the role of the ALRA, how would we ensure that those bargaining negotiations were adhered to by, by the private sector or by the trade unions in that, in that sense? Yeah, uh, just an answer to your first question, I, I can happily send the clerk of your committee the terms of reference of the forum, and uh, we've, we've published three papers that are with the Minister for the Economy, uh, and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, Sinead Kelly, who's been touching me, gets copies of those as well. And, and like it's, it's certainly not a secret society. We, we, we want to promote the work of the forum uh, because we think it has merit. So if, if, if yourself, Mr O'Dowd, or any other member is, is having difficulty getting information, Certainly the terms of reference are very illustrative and I think if you see them you'll see exactly the purpose. On the collective, on the sector of collective bargaining, yes it would require uh, changes to legislation. Um, whether it would require changes to the legislation around, for example, the uh, role and function of the LRA, it, it possibly would. But what you would be doing is, I mean we have a national minimum wage um, and we have legal minimums when it comes to you know, basic, basic entitlements. Uh, what you'd be doing here is you'd be creating a context. It's kind of like b back in the day across the UK, you had the old wages. Uh, you have an agricultural forum, I think, still. But you have the old uh, wage bargaining uh, entities, and Margaret Thatcher abolished them uh, in the 80s. We're talking about a modern version of those. So, so you're basically saying, for example, in contract cleaning, which I think is a good example, so privatised contract cleaning, um, you know, their, their margins are very tight. Uh, and wages are a variable. So we found that the employers in the Republic of Ireland, many of which operate in Northern Ireland, G4S, Noonans, etc., they wanted to take wages out of competition. They worked this joint labour committee system. Uh, we agreed minimums above the legal minimum wage, above the both statutory sick pay, above the legal uh, you know, annual leave, etc., etc. And they were the minimums that applied. But, but then you could negotiate if an employer was prepared to agree for additional premiums, for example, for contract cleaners, say, in hospitals working in sterile environments and things like that. But what it did was it took wages out of competition. Now, it would require uh, legislative change, but we have the scope for that because employment rights is a devolved matter. And what, it would be, what you would be saying is that this is the minimum in this industry, and it would bring a level of, of decency, and it would address the issue that Northern Ireland is of the eight UK regions the, the, the place with the lowest pay, 30% of our workers earn below the real living wage. And it would address fundamentals like that, and it would bring more money into the economy because people on low pay spend, they don't save, and it would have a, a, a positive effect for the economy as well as an important effect for them and their families. So yes, it would require legislative change, and it would require consideration, and it would require choice as to what sectors would this apply to. Uh, but I would suggest sectors where union density is low is, uh, is something where it should apply to because, you know, where union density is low, pay is particularly low, uh, and sectors, um, you know, retail, contract cleaning, security, those type of, of blue-collar sectors, the hospitality sector, they are the areas, I think, uh, where both employers and unions would benefit from this because it would also facilitate uh, good, decent productivity discussions as well uh, because, obviously, you know, if you're bargaining over uh, improvements to pay, there's a quid pro quo there. Uh, so yes, legislative change would be required, possibly for the role of the LRA. How would you how would you ensure that it's adhered to? Um, well, these would be the minimum terms, uh, and obviously it has to have a labour inspectorate that was robust enough that if we found employers were in breach of paying the minimum terms in a particular industry, uh, no different to when they're in breach of the national minimum wage, that they would be challenged, that they would be penalised, and that they would be embarrassed. Uh, and that they would be uh, made rectify the situation, uh, and you know, you know, you could have tribunals for things like that. But there, are, there are mechanisms uh, where that could be modelled. Okay, thank you. So, um, can I just pick up on some of the points that you made around that? Um, obviously, in the new decade, new approach um, document back in January, uh, one of the um, 
one of the, the measures in terms of the programme for government was looking towards ban and zero hour contracts and the powers to set minimum wage here by devolving it. Um, has there been any progress that you're aware of in relation to those two um, items or has that been anything that's been discussed in terms of the, the engagement forum? Uh, we, we haven't as of yet in the engagement forum because to be fair it's all been about the, the economic response to the, 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 the COVID-19 crisis but I was very enthused when I read the NDA document the section on workers' rights and the section on economic rights, I thought, was, was uh, I have to say, whoever wrote it, I couldn't have written it better myself. Uh, it was three sentences, but it was excellent. And we had written to the Minister for the Economy, uh, Diane Dodds, to seek a meeting before the global pandemic on it. Uh, and obviously that meeting has yet to take place because of uh, the pandemic. But um, the department are very well aware that we believe meat needs to be put on that bone and i actually think if we trans if if, if we transcribe what's in the uh, new decade new approach document on workers rights into law which is fully within the competency of the northern ireland executive uh, we would be doing a great service to workers to business uh, and to to the future of work in this society in this economy and i think it's a it's a really really important issue uh, and it's one uh, that we want to work with uh, the executive on over 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 the next period. Now, I, I don't think there's been much progress on a on a, a program for government apart from that document, uh, because obviously the, the global pandemic has has, has taken uh, over everything. But we do believe that issue is crucial. In fact, I think um, I had written to yourselves to, to ask to come and talk to you on that specific issue. Uh, and, and to be fair, you had said we would, and then obviously events uh, overtook. But um, we, we'd be happy to, to come back on a separate occasion and, and go through the specifics on that and how we could put, put flesh on, on, on the bone in those really, really important words uh, in the NDA document on workers' rights and economic rights. We were very enthused to hear that that was agreed, not only by the five parties, uh, but by the UK government and the Republic of Ireland government. Um, and our attitude was, we want Stormont to come back, but if it doesn't, if, if, you know, if the UK government and the Irish government have agreed it, we need it implemented. Uh, and we have the scope to do this, unlike Scotland and Wales, where employment rights is not devolved. So uh, we're very hopeful. Uh, we think those words need to be turned into, into legislative uh, uh, means. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, particularly important in the context of the economic recovery that um, we, we have those um, yeah. expedited. So I think that's something we should take up with the Minister also. And yeah, we will be really happy to get you back to, to brief us further on that as well. Um, Gary? Uh, thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks uh, for the presentation. Um, I, I absolutely agree with the sentiment around um, looking in the future at workers, and we know that uh, this COVID-19 crisis has brought out uh, really who uh, the essential workers are and who the key workers are, and I think that we need to, as we go forward, reflect on that. Yeah. Uh, and put more value on those workers. Um, uh, you know, as somebody, you know, I, I worked in a supermarket myself <laughs> a, a number of years ago, and I know that a lot of those people do not feel uh, valued. Uh, and I think that uh, we, we need to reflect on that, and we look at that and say, look, uh, you know, thank you for the work, but we need to see how we can repay them going forward as well. Uh, I suppose I want to come back to, we, we've talked a lot about the engagement forum, and you've said yourself about the engagement forum, the focus has been around getting a response to COVID. 19. Uh, I suspect, and we've no detail at this stage in terms of what comes after the engagement forum and how that looks, I suspect the focus will be on the recovery. Uh, and I appreciate that you've raised a lot of issues, a lot of long standing issues, which no doubt uh, many of which will have to be addressed. Uh, but we need to look, I suppose, at this time around focusing on how we uh, do the recovery. I wanted just to, to touch on obviously, you're an all island body. Uh, how, how is your operation in the Republic of Ireland in comparison w with ourselves here? Is there a similar process around an engagement forum in the Republic of Ireland? Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. Biddleton. We, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, from the late 1980s up to 2008, you had social partnership. We had centralised collective bargaining. So the trade union movement, the employers, farmers, etc., every three years would have bargained on pay and, and a lot of other issues, I should say, uh, with, with the state, and that developed and developed, and then with the financial crash, uh, that collapsed, essentially. Um, there is what's called a Labour Employer Economic Forum, which brings together the ICTU in the Republic of Ireland with the government, along with uh, IBEC, who are the CBI's sister organisation, 
Chambers Ireland and the CIF, which is the Construction Industry Federation, and they've done similar work. Uh, they've done a, a very important safety protocol for returning to work. Uh, they meet with the uh, Irish uh, Taoiseach and, and uh, his uh, economy minister um, quite regularly, uh, along with a number of key civil servants. So there has been that tradition of social dialogue in the Republic of Ireland that we haven't had in Northern Ireland. Um, but I have to say, uh, when Minister Dodd set up the Northern Ireland Engagement Forum, uh, I had calls from the TUC in Britain, from the STUC and the Welsh TUC, asking, you know, what is this? It looks really interesting. Can you tell us about it? We need something similar specifically uh, for this. So I think right across the island, the trade union federations are, are broadly working similar. And actually, we have a meeting, uh, by, by, by obviously, virtual meeting uh, tomorrow to discuss our, our work and our progress. But it, it is very similar. But I think the difference is, there is a longer tradition of that social dialogue in the Republic of Ireland, uh, and my sense is the tradition uh, is, is, is new here, and I just think we need to capture it. Uh, I, I've been at points to point out that um, when, when we've met with politicians, because we lobbied all of the parties on this over the last three years, looking for their support on, on a forum for social dialogue, and we kept making the point, you know, the, 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 the 90 MLAs have an electoral mandate, the executive has a, a mandate to govern, uh, what we want to do is, is, is look at bringing employers and unions together to try and resolve critical issues. Or, you know, for example, if there are specific issues in the program for government uh, where there's maybe, you know, to be fair, given you have a five-party and policy coalition, differences of opinion. If they're around the economic sphere, well, if they were given to the forum and you bring together the voice of trade unions and business and we can come together on it, I, I think we could assist uh, that work but it's 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 but obviously you know we have our own agenda as do the employers but but broadly similar work is going on across these islands uh but uh there are different traditions and different histories i think i've always felt when i've met my colleagues across the islands that we in northern ireland were, were lacking with social dialogue i'm delighted to say now with this forum i think we've, we've, we've started on a journey but we do need to when we get through this look at well what's the purpose of it is it to be advisory? Is it to be more instructive? What's its composition? Um, and I think it needs to be focused. Trade unions and employers, along with uh, a couple of key uh, politicians from the executive office uh, and with some of the economic uh, bodies to look at those key issues that I've, that I've mentioned earlier. Okay, thanks, Chair. I think that you know clearly uh, all the deputations that we've had from various sectors, the engagement forum has been useful. But I think we are coming to the point where we need to look at where the engagement forum is going. I know it's a matter for no doubt the minister as well, but uh, it, it's something that that will be of importance, I think, as we we move forward in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, John Stewart. Thank you. Hi, right, Chair. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and thanks for your presentation so far. It's been highly enlightening. Um, I think you can hear me okay, yeah? Yes, yes. yes. That's what told you. Yeah. Um, my question, I've got a, a number, but I'll just, the, the, the main one here is, is around um, working conditions. Um, whenever this, um, the lockdown began and some factories and other bigger manufacturers stayed open, there was a lot of complaints to my office from workers about the conditions they were facing. Um, I have to say that they have dropped off in a massive, to, 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 in a massive way to a very small level now. Um, is that because um, those factories and manufacturers have got themselves in gear and have got those measures in place, or is it because they're being funneled through to other organisations? And just to add to that, then, do you have a concern still that when um, the economy does start to broaden up again, that there will be still a lot of ambiguity for companies and to what? is expected in terms of social distancing and requirements to protect workers and customers. Um, could there be more clarity on that guidance? Thank you. Yeah, th th thanks very much, John. Uh, yes, I, I think it was a number of factors why those complaints were particularly high at the start and why they tapered off. Um, working through this together, COVID-19, the safety document that, that, we, that we developed and that the minister published and the executive endorsed, uh, I, I noticed when I looked at the uh, NI business, the, the DFE website, the date that was published, you saw a spike uh, in the internet usage of, of people actually looking at that document and indeed the priority list. So I think awareness uh, was important. And I think that document, and actually when I compare it with its equivalent in England, Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland, it, it stands very, very, 
very, very well. It's, and I think the fact that it came from unions and employers working together in a subcommittee about, you know, with the HSCNI and others in the PHA, I think it shows it's robust. And they are the minimum things that need to happen for a workplace to come back to work. I'll give you another example. Bombardier, obviously a very key and important employer, invested a lot of money in safety. And what they did was they engaged with their unions immediately at the outset, the safety reps, up through what was needed. And it was done on a partnership basis. And um, obviously, sadly, we've had that fire uh, there, unfortunately. But, you know, the workers that did come back to work, um, I know from talking to Unite and GNB, they came back more safely. There were flashpoints, there's no doubt about it, in the food industry at the outset. uh, And there were some flashpoints in the red meat industry in the last few weeks. Uh, And I think, you know, there's been greater awareness. um, And I think, you know, the HSCNI, it's quite clear, and I'm sure it's no different to every other health and safety authority across Europe. Um, It hasn't been fully equipped to address and deal with this pandemic. It has 27 uh, field inspectors. um, uh, No different to the Republic of Ireland, England, Scotland or Wales. Uh, There probably would never uh, be enough to, to address this. But there does need to be a greater level of inspection and enforcement because it's 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 the minority and i stress the minority of employers who will breach the health and safety the progressive employers who will work with unions there isn't usually an issue uh, but that minority shouldn't undercut or put the safety of their workers or their clients uh, at, 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 at an exposed way. So, so I, I think a number of things. I, I think the forum certainly had a uh, had a role. I think the unions on the ground had a fundamental role. Um, and I think I'm not surprised you got calls to your office because, as we know, you know, only about 35% of workers in Northern Ireland are actually in a union. Um, and there's a lot of and there's a lot of fear. I mean, there are workers who would be fearful of going back to work, even though. In certain instances, the workplace may be safe, and, and that's maybe because there's a kind of a, a, a relationship issue, or, or, or you know. So we can manage all of that, and these things need to be treated compassionately and carefully. Um, I hope as we go forward, uh, we're updating that safety document this week uh, with further recommendations that will be put into the Minister for the Economy, um, uh, because it's, it has to be a living, breathing uh, document. Uh, we're looking at things like uh, risk assessments that must be required. We've made it very clear there has to be two meter social distancing. If you cannot have that, there has to be the appropriate PPE and necessary screens. Um, and you know there are some very good examples of some employers uh, doing uh, the right thing and working in partnership. Uh, unfortunately, it's the examples of those that don't that we hear more about. But but that needs to be exposed and, and, and challenged. No, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, Owen and Paul. I think we uh, have found the presentation very useful and informative, and I think uh, it's good, um, Owen, that you recognise the the support measures that have been put in by the executive and the UK government for for the workforce. Obviously, the furlough scheme has been very significant. I'm glad you recognise that has been very positive, and the fact that it's going to be extended, I'm sure you you also uh, would would welcome that. Um, and of course, the engagement forum has been useful, and we all appreciate the work you've done on it and uh, the measures that you work through. And we appreciate, you know, the concerns. We've all, we're, we're all aware of them. I brought to our attention, especially in larger places of work, where people were concerned about social distancing measures not being put in place. But I, I remain to be convinced uh, on the whole issue of where we go from here with the engagement forum. I uh, appreciate your points made. I've listened, and I'm uh, willing to listen further. Perhaps you need to do more to get more people involved in the trade unions. You've just said 35% of the people in Northern Ireland are in a union, so perhaps there, there's other work to be done rather than the engagement forum. De- definitely. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and, um, and, and I, I appreciate as MLAs, you're elected politicians living in your communities. You, you, you hear about things we hear about, um, and you're, you're very much in touch with your constituents. Um, there, there is much to be done, and I want to stress, uh, you know, in doing this, this the work, we have to look at ourselves as a, as a trade union movement, and we have to look at where our inefficiencies and our inadequacies are, and we have to analyse that. We cannot just be critical of forces 
uh, beyond ourselves. I think every organization needs to take a good hard look at itself from time to time and assess what it's doing right and is it connecting uh, with workers. But I did mention earlier on, we, we do have mandatory trade union recognition that was brought in during the Blair Labour government in the, in the, in the late 90s. Um, but its problem in the context of Northern Ireland is uh, you have to have at least 20 or 21 people in the firm, in the, in the bargaining agent. And as I've said earlier on, I think 97% of Northern Ireland firms have less than 20 people. So that legislation is effectively not that really relevant here. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, you can encourage all the workers to join the firm. Uh, but if it's smaller than 20, you can't coerce the employer to negotiate with you. And there are issues there. Uh, where I would strongly suggest that, you know, if you have a situation where workers want to be independently represented, you know, employers should be encouraged and there should be a requirement on them to sit down and negotiate with trade unions for the benefit of the firm uh, and for the benefit of, of the workers. So uh, I, I don't want to suggest in any way that the engagement forum is the be all and end all of our work. Certainly not. We're involved in a lot of other work. I'm just conscious that the agenda today is the trade in response to COVID-19 uh, and obviously the engagement forum is, 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 a, is a key element in that um, but there's a lot of work to be done for sure and, and we're engaged in it in the public sector and the private sector um, but I do think the state could assist in productivity in addressing low pay uh, in all those things by improving the environment the legislative environment that trade unions have to work in um, because, you know, I, I think it's fundamentally wrong if you have a majority of workers in a firm that want to be represented by a trade union if the employer resists and gets away with that. Uh, you know, I also think we shouldn't have conscription. I mean, you know, no one should be compelled to join a union. That should be a, 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 a free choice thing. We want volunteers, not conscripts. But certainly uh, we have a lot of work to do, uh, and I, I hope and I think you've acknowledged that, you know, uh, we're, we're far from perfect uh, you know, but we're part of, we've got some solutions. We don't have all the answers, but I think working with the state, working with employers and working with others, we can make a contribution. And I do feel up to this point, we haven't been facilitated making the contribution uh, that we can make. And I think the engagement forum has been a good example to show that we can make a contribution. And I hope there are going to be many others. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, Sinead? Sinead? Should be there. Christopher's going to come in and Sinead can... Get her yeah. back. Hello there and uh, thank you for uh, your presentation and your comments. Um, I didn't work in a supermarket like Derry Middleton, but I worked for a period of time when I was a student in the sterile services department of the city hospital, and I can tell you that was hard work. That was hard, hard work, and I think Gary's absolutely right in terms of reprioritizing who actually are the key workers in our society. My wife works in B&M, and I suspect people probably think her contribution is more key than mine right now, so I, I absolutely do uh, agree with... Um, <laughs> with what you've said around that. She works harder, isn't it? She works harder. Um, <laughs> look at me's hard work, Gordon. Yeah. Um, in, work terms of, hard work. in terms of... Uh, in terms of the, <clears throat> the social model that was in place in the Republic of Ireland that survived up until uh, the crash, um, is there any prospect of a similar model being put in place again? Because if it was, a, if it was an external trauma that effectively smashed it up. We're facing into another potential crash in the economy and smashing it up. So I'm just wondering, in terms of trying to recreate that model, has there been any initiative in that direction? And is it possible that we could be in a similar position here in Northern Ireland? Yeah, I don't think, that from the trade union point of view, Christopher, I don't think we would want to recreate the model that collapsed in 2008. In some ways, the fact that it collapsed at a time of crisis mm. shows to a large degree it was, it was a bit of a hollow shell. Um, and I know many politicians had issues with it because they felt you had employers, unions, farm, farmers coming together, effectively making decisions that made law, ultimately, and parliamentarians felt 
in, to some degree that they were uh, on the on the fringes and, and that it got too big for what it was intended. Uh, so I don't think that model will come back. I don't think you'll have centralised wage bargaining in the private sector in the Republic of Ireland. You do have a one size fits all. Uh, public sector pay agreement, um, and we've always had that even with the economic crash, and we had pay cuts of up to 20-odd percent. Thankfully, they're largely being restored. The last one is October of this year, the final 2 percent. I can't see the model that lasted from the 87 to 2008 being restored, but you can see we're advocating for, for, for a variety of other models, um, sectoral collective bargaining, like I've said, um, local bargaining, and, and some kind of a national social dialogue like what we're trying to model here uh, in Northern Ireland as well. So I think you're seeing the trade unions in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland broadly singing from a similar hymn sheet, albeit in different jurisdictions with different politics, saying, look, the voice of, of, of trade unions and this side of the labour market needs to be heard in any recovery. Uh, and we would argue that the recovery needs to be different from 2008. We can't have another decade of austerity. You know, interest rates are historically low. There needs to be significant borrowing. And that point of employers' national insurance, I mean, our paper published today shows that across the UK, employers pay on average 41% of what their peers across Europe pay when it comes to national insurance. So there is a deficit there. Uh, so I, I, in answer to your question, uh, I don't think that model that we had will be reinvented, but I think a similar, a, a different version of it, a more without centralised pay bargaining. And, and again, we don't want to have centralised pay bargaining in, in Northern Ireland. The unions can do their own bargaining on pay, but we think on the other issues, there's merit in bringing the various groups together. That's fine. Thank you. Um, Sinead? Sinead? She's unlocked her screen, so... Claire. Um, we'll move on to Claire and we'll come back to Sinead again. Claire, can you hear us okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Owen, Paul. Um, just those two points I want to raise. Um, I, I, I kind of want to uh, comment on your comments in relation to the future role of any sort of uh, forum in, in terms of uh, the supporting uh, government policy. I think with um, any project, whether it's a government one or, or whether it's a business project, you know, the first aim of that is to identify key stakeholders. And I think that's what we need to be doing moving forward. It's not to say that a forum or anything like it would displace what's already there in terms of politicians, um, but it would add to that greater picture. Um, in my previous life in the department, one of the first things that I asked my uh, officials to do was to create a stakeholder database. And it was to identify as many people as possible um, that would have had an interest in, in, in those issues. And I think it's entirely appropriate that trade unions and other uh, advocates and, and representatives have that voice. And I don't think we've been very good at that up until now, because I do think there seems to be a fear that it will displace what's already there in form of political representation. But certainly, I think from my perspective as a politician, I don't assume that my opinion and everybody that I'm speaking to is, is the full picture. And indeed, I seek to meet as many stakeholders as possible to try and form a balanced opinion on that view. And I think that's what government needs to be doing. You know, if, if anything, you know, that one of the, the kind of silver linings to this whole pandemic is that I do think it's forcing us into better governance. And I think one of the key faucets of good governance is about listening to as many people as possible who have an interest and who will, you know, any of the decisions that we make as politicians, you know, will will affect them. So, you know, I, I certainly um, support um, a role for a forum or something like it moving forward. And, you know, to, to kind of uh, it, uh, implement that idea that people have ideas and opinions that may be beyond the ones that we, that we currently hold. And I think it's OK to, to shape and, current, uh, and improve our policy on the basis of listening to as many people as possible. So, yes, I, I do see very much a role for, for the forum moving uh, forward. Um, I think it has to be advised. I don't think it needs to be instructive um, in the sense that, you know, all, all you know, we can expect is that you put forward suggestions and ideas. And again, listening to other people as well as the forum, um, we, we uh, make a balanced decision on that basis. Um, my second point, and I think you sort of touched on it earlier, was in relation to, to coming back to work and the challenges that will face. I have a slight concern 
given um, a number of constituents who have contacted me about how some employers, not all, must have been great, um, are facilitating coming back to work. I'm hearing stories where employers are asking their staff to come back to work while still on furlough, um, which you know I understand to be incorrect. Increasing hours, changes of contracts. Now, I understand legally they can't do that. Um, the LRA were very good um, in providing that advice to us last week. But there is a fear amongst employees who maybe aren't as informed as I am or as others or don't know how to access that information that if they don't come back to work, then the alternative is losing their jobs. And I am really concerned at the end of the furlough period, particularly that first phase, whenever it changes from employers mm. not contributing and you know to contributing, how many redundancies we will see, uh, redundancies we will see at that point. So. Um, how do we get that message out there about what you know employees' rights are, um, you know what they should expect in, in these next coming weeks as we, as we begin the process of recovery? Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire. To deal with your, your second point, you, I think you're spot on, and uh, you know I think a lot of those constituents are probably working in smaller firms where maybe there's no trade union and you know no workplace safety rep or, or things like that and, and and I can understand that fear and I mean going back to Gordon Dunn's point there's an obligation on us as a, as a trade union organisation and others to, to get that message out beyond our, our, our own existing ranks. I would suggest as well there's, there's a huge obligation on the state authorities uh, and the various state institutions uh, you know uh, and departments be it the DFE, the LRA to promote and to get information out to, to, to citizens across Northern Ireland on, on their rights as well um, because it's crucial. I mean, if a worker's furloughed, they're furloughed, they're, they're not at work. Now, th there's a change coming in in the scheme where there's going to be, it's going to facilitate short-term working as well, which, which would be good. Um, but, but we cannot have these informal relations and we, we need to ensure that as workers come back to a workplace, that workplace is safe. Um, one of the changes we're hoping to see uh, in, in the safety document is uh, the whole idea of risk assessments. Uh, and that you know there would have to be a risk assessment carried out, excuse me, in the given workplace to make sure that it is safe and that it's and that it's kind of known. So I think there's an obligation on certainly us to try and uh, get out beyond our own 200,000 members. Um, but there's a real obligation on the state agencies uh, who have a statutory responsibility in this area to promote the facts and the information uh, on this. Um, uh, because no, you know, no one should be going back to an unsafe workplace um, in the interest of their family, but in the interest of the wider community, because we, we all have to do our, our bit here. On your first point, I think you're spot on as, as well, Claire. I mean, uh, I have found when I've met with a number of politicians over the last three years when we promoted the idea of social dialogue, there was a bit of a fear, well, you know, who, who are you guys? We're, we're the elected politicians, and, 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 and certainly we're not trying to do, do their job. Running for election is a, is a challenge in itself, and fair play to anybody who does it. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't swap, uh, I'll say that. But um, I, I, I do think, for example, if you look at, say, the NDNA, the piece on economic rights and workers' rights, I mean, that's a piece of work that a social dialogue forum could do and, and, and do a very comprehensive report and make some key recommendations to the DFE department and minister as to how we should take that forward in the interest of, of, of labour, workers, but also in the interest of, 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 the, of the employers. So, you know, I think, I think we could do it. And, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we can look at Scotland mm. and Wales, who are similar devolved nations, where, where they're doing similar things. Uh, and I think it adds to our politics. And the fact that we have a particularly unique politics here, where we have an involuntary coalition of five political parties, uh, this also has the potential to be a, 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 an extra vehicle to, 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 to assist that. Not to be beholden to it, because you know we're not talking about that, uh, but, but to assist that process, because we all want to support uh, de devolution where we can. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 <laughs> oh, great. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much, Owen and Paul, for, for your presentation and answering the questions um, this morning. Well, the first um, the first one, I suppose, is, is for Owen, and it, it's back to the child care and child care policy in Northern Ireland. And I, and I agree totally. Child care um, policy is actually a labour policy, and, and it should never be um, misinterpreted as anything else. 
uh, and for a very long time, childcare within Northern Ireland has been very prohibitive, um, and it's hit the particular barrier to the labour market, uh, and and mostly, um, and not always, but particularly uh, to women. Uh, and it has made yeah. our economy weaker. And I think that this is a time maybe to, to reset the watch. Uh, and we have had seen, we've seen, you know, emergency childcare provision, um, uh, a model been put in place very, very quickly during this pandemic. Uh, and this is something that I think that we should look at uh, within, within the economy, uh, certainly because we need a stimulus package in order to, to, to get out of the, the, the current crisis. Um, have, have you done further research in this uh, area, Owen, or is, is this the beginning of a process? Because I know that there's other models within uh, the European Union that are light years ahead uh, when it comes to childcare and how the, the impact on the economy has greatly improved uh, given uh, greater access and provision uh, and into, into the economy for, for many more people. Yeah, thanks very much, Shane. We produced a paper last year of which I'll send to the clerk uh, a soft copy for each and every one of you to, to the clerk of your committee, Sinead Kelly, whose email I have uh, on childcare in Northern Ireland. And actually, it was a collaborative piece of work with, with Paul and his colleagues uh, who did the research. And it, 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 it does a snapshot on childcare in Northern Ireland today, uh, who uses what and who pays for what and how it's funded. It looks at it in comparison to England, Scotland and Wales, and it makes a number of key recommendations. And, and I would suggest the policy paper is, is probably more relevant today than it was May of last year when we published it. I've sent it round to uh, the colleagues on the Northern Engagement Forum to the employers and the, and the LRA as well, but uh, we'd happily uh, share it with you when I come off the meeting, I'll send it to the clerk immediately. And it has a number of policy proposals uh, around it, but, but it's so urgent now because you know, we, we, as I said, we, we, we know that probably a quarter of the workforce uh, have, who, have, who need childcare have both parents or all the parents in their household, if they're a single parent household, uh, working. And, you know, as they are required to come back to work, we know that half of all childcare uh, needs are catered by extended family in Northern Ireland. It's 47%. And many of those extended family members are, are, are out of the game right now because maybe they're over 70 or, you know, grandparents and, you know, with, with shielding and, and all that goes with that. So there is a real urgent need and it, it needs to be, we always felt it was a social issue, but it, it's also a critical piece of economic infrastructure, uh, you know? So, um, and the doc that we have proposes to, 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 to look after the interests of the children, working parents, but also those that provide the childcare because it is a Cinderella industry, 98% female, 47% paid below the real living wage. And it's, you know, it, it's, you know, like when you think about it, in the life cycle, uh, we pay our teachers in primary, secondary and third level, uh, you know, a, a decent salary when we value work. But look at how we treat those who look after our most vulnerable, home care uh, for elderly patients. Uh, and uh, those that provide childcare. If, if you look at that bell curve, I would suggest that the terms and conditions of employment of those who provide care for those at their final stage of life and the first stage of life, they're not as good as they should be. Uh, whereas, you know, primary, secondary and tertiary education is on a different field. And I think, like all of the members of the committee have said, this crisis is, is, is rough and difficult, but it is an opportunity for us to rethink our society and how we want to construct it. Uh, and I think childcare has to be a fundamental uh, element of that, those who provide it uh, and, and those who, who need it. So I'll send that paper on to, on to the clerk. That's excellent, Owen. Uh, and predominantly the people that work in both those uh, sectors that you mentioned are, are women, uh, are women. By, by and large, yep. uh, and, and very low paid. Uh, and it's something that we need to, um, yep. as I say, reset. The other, the other just quick question um, to Paul, this is, um, in relation to um, the, the future of work, uh, and I see that he has been making, um, or he has, uh, has been talking about that in previous forums, but um, 
one of the areas that I'm concerned at for, for, for now coming out of this pandemic is our young people uh, and, and particularly those that are leaving school and those that are leaving uh, university uh, and the fact that there's going to be very high rates of unemployment. But I'm also thinking about people that are in employment uh, and about access to in-job training. Um, has he, is he currently working in any research documents uh, in relation to that? Um, that's for you, Paul, sorry. Yeah, um, to take on, on, on the, the, the point about, about young people, um, yes, they are going to be um, based you know, purely on looking at the sectors that have been most affected. Young people are going to take, uh, they're going to take the hit uh, this time, uh, and, and unfortunately, given that um, that was the same uh, generational cohort that took the hit back in 2008. Um, in terms of, it depends on how we how we manage uh, the, the the recovery. There are going to be a certain amount of jobs that are that are going to be lost. A certain amount of them we could expect to come back uh, when the economy begins to recover. A certain amount of them are going to be to be permanently lost. And I think that that's a significant area where policy needs to take action, and particularly on the the skills agenda. There is some benefit in the fact that younger people are more likely um, to to take up reskilling um, and to switch um, uh, industry or, or career, and it's 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 more possible uh, for them to to do so. But I think we definitely need to take a, a very hard, long look at the skills uh, infrastructure we have in place uh, in Northern Ireland, and talk as much about the supply of skills as the demand uh, of skills within uh, the economy if we are going to have uh, uh, job retraining programs either for those in employment or those who've been recently made unemployed we need to ensure that we're not just churning people through courses or uh, through colleges and then dumping them out of the other side of it into a labor market which has no appetite for the skills that we've just given them we need to have that coordination between what business uh, and, uh, and, and and what jobs in the Northern Ireland economy uh, require um, and what we're, what we're investing in in terms of skills. That requires a certain amount of coordination uh, from, from the executive in terms of where it sees its economic recovery plan going. If we're going to, say, take this as an opportunity to invest um, in climate change mitigations in terms of our energy or transport uh, infrastructure, what kind of skills does that need? Um, and that needs to be married to any kind of approach we take uh, in terms of attempting to uh, to tackle the problem uh, of imp impending um, large-scale uh, unemployment. So I think in, in, in regards to that, the, the key word is, is, is coordination between um, the sectors uh, and the policymakers uh, within the Northern Ireland economy. If we don't have that kind of cooperation and coordination, um, we're not going to get um, we're not going to get a, a, a decent uh, recovery out of this. Thanks, Paul. I couldn't agree more. Um, thank you very much for uh, all your uh, answering the questions today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, in relation to uh, the new normal, uh, part of that will be more people working from home, I suspect, um, which brings its own opportunities. It also brings challenges in terms of terms and conditions uh, for those staff and workers who are, are working from home, and that. That, that line between when there is working hours and when there is non-working hours because with more and more uh, uh, IT available to us and more and more information flow, sending emails outside work hours, expecting to respond to work hours outside right. normal work hours, etc. Uh, it can become the norm by accident if nothing else. Has uh, either of you looked at in terms of that possible new norm of how we protect workers and staff in, in their home places. Yeah, yeah. So, work as, as we speak on the whole issue of home working, uh, we're, we're our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland are, are looking at it from their perspective, and, and we're looking at it from, from up here. Um, because it is crucial that if, and I mean, more workers are going to work from home uh, b b because they, they want to, and because some employers are going to probably require it because they may wish to, you know, uh, realise some capital when it comes to real estate and things like that. Um, but it can't just kind of happen casually, nor should it happen casually, because you know, work is work and home is home, uh, and we need to get the balance right because we know that uh, many workers will have 
caring responsibilities, not just for their, their own children, but maybe for, for, for elderly parents and others, shielding as well. So it needs to be done properly, and it, it's crucial that the terms and conditions of employment that workers currently have that are agreed in the given workplace, that they're honoured and that they're adhered to. And it's also crucial uh, that we, we put out a three-page infographic on social media about just the key things that need to be done and the key things that need to be uh, considered. Uh, but, but, but it's crucial that it needs to be resourced and, and funded. Um, I mean, one of our unions, which up organises on an all-island basis, the Financial Services Union, has a campaign, you know, the, the time to switch off because, you know, obviously a, a lot of office workers work at home, they're, they're, they're never off because of email and modern technology. So it's something that we're, we're, we're looking at. It's something we're looking at across Europe, actually, as well, through the European Trade Union Congress. And we're going to have to put together a template probably now that is more comprehensive and definitive because obviously this pandemic has certainly uh, changed things in, in a very serious way. There, there, are, there are workers that will want to work from home. There, there are others that won't because they like the psychology of, of going to work. And then there are workplaces where it's just not feasible. So uh, it's about making sure that there's an adequate choice that suits both sides of the labour market. But for our perspective, it is crucial to ensure uh, that the rights and the conditions of employment are, are adhered to and protected, and that the infrastructure required from working from home, you know, uh, is, is properly resourced by the employer, as, as you would expect them to do so in the workplace. So it's a piece of work we're currently uh, working on, and, and, and we hope to come out with something in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, both of you, Owen and Paul, there's just one final thing I wanted to, to pick up on with you. Um, Today, 40 organisations have written to the First and Deputy First Minister around um, the need for a Green New Deal coming out of the, the economic recovery. Um, and I just wanted to get some thoughts around um, you know, how we have this opportunity now to kind of plan and, um, I suppose, put in place a, a just transition model to, to move um, forward on that. Um, and I know um, Neary has done some work in relation to that, and I know the, the trade union organisations are obviously in favour of that kind of just transmission, transition model as well. Um, so just wanted to get, to, um, get some thoughts around that. Yeah. Paul, do you want to kick off there? Yeah, no, uh, in terms of the, the work that, uh, that Neri has done in this uh, area, we, are, we, we have uh, uh, policy papers just there before Christmas in terms of looking at the, at the situation as it is in the uh, Republic of Ireland, and we are... Uh, currently drafting um, uh, similar proposals uh, for for Northern Ireland, um, very much based on um, on looking at the the current situation uh, and trying to build uh, uh, sort of trying to build uh, the idea of a green new deal, but very much basing it uh, in in terms of the economy we have it, as it is currently structured, um, and uh, and sort of guiding um, away towards the significant investments. Um, that, that we would need uh, that we would need to make in terms of making that uh, uh, the, that transition to a decarbonised uh, economy, but the just transition piece is, is obviously uh, very key for for us when we're looking at uh, employment uh, impacts uh, of moving towards uh, a decarbonised uh, economy, um, and we're very clear that we need to. Um, that when we when we embark on this on this programme of, 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 of a green new deal, we need to have. We need to map out the areas of risk uh, in terms of employment in, in the Northern Ireland economy. We need to accept that this kind of fundamental change uh, is going to, to disrupt um, uh, lives and, and livelihoods, um, and that, um, that if certain, um, certain uh, sectors uh, of the economy are going to need to fundamentally change, that's going to change uh, jobs, and it's going to lead to some job losses and the creation uh, of other jobs to, to replace them, hopefully. And the just transition piece is obviously about managing um, the employment uh, uh, flows um, as we uh, embark uh, on, that, uh, on that significant change. But I think it sort of it feeds into the, to, the, to, the, to the situation that we're currently in in terms of our response to the, to the coronavirus, that we, the government took a decision that for a large number of people, um, that for the benefit of wider society, their work was no longer allowed to be performed. And we decided that it was fair and just 
that we would provide them with the support schemes like the um, the job uh, retention scheme, because it wasn't it wasn't their fault um, that their that their form of work was no longer uh, permissible uh, under this situation. And it's the same moral judgment when you're talking about moving um, to a decarbonised economy. If we are making the judgment that for the betterment uh, of our environment that certain forms of economic activity are no longer going to take place or are going to fundamentally change. There is an onus on the state in that, uh, in that uh, situation to provide the kind of support uh, to workers who are facing uh, that fundamental change. And that's very much um, where we see um, uh, our input uh, in terms of, uh, of, of any Green New Deal and putting a just transition at the heart of that. I think, I think Paul has hit the nail on the head there, making the comparison with the, the, the job retention schemes uh, in the UK and, and similar schemes we're seeing right across uh, Europe. Um, and it's the exact same argument for, for uh, the just transition. I, I think we're having a lot of problems in the Republic of Ireland. The you know, board of Mona uh, have not handled it properly and they've given workers very little notice and the state are trying to, 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 to pull something from that and make it better. But, but there's a long way to go. But we would look to the likes of Asturias in northern Spain, um, where they decarbonized and effectively moved their, from, from their coal industry to alternative uh, forms of, of energy generation. And they did it over a long, long period. Um, and, and you need to resource people uh, adequately, as Paul has said. So uh, we're, we're, that's, that's a collaborative piece of work north and south between NERI and ICTU. With, with um, your comments, Paul, um, and I look forward to, to that um, paper being published and um, be something we'd be really interested in. Um, I thank you both very much for your time this morning. It has been really, really helpful, and, and we will be back in touch with you in relation to picking up on, on the other work in relation to um, moving forward around the employment rights and the economic rights um, from NDNA. And thanks again. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Sorry, we're okay. Okay. Andrew should be on the line. Um, is Andrew, are you on the line? Good morning. I'm on the line. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, so we're moving on then to item number five on the agenda, which is our, our briefing from FinTech on the impact of COVID-19. Um, there's a clerk's memo at page 16. There is a briefing paper from the FinTech Envoy at page 18. And then there is a um, FinTech ecosystem map at page 20 of your pack. Um, and I'd like to welcome Andrew Jenkins, who's the FinTech envoy um, for here in the north, uh, to our meeting this morning. Um, Andrew, do you want to make a, an opening statement? And then we will open it up to members for, for some discussion and questions. Yes, thank you, Chair. And thank you um, to the committee for uh, the opportunity to brief you today, um, particularly at a time when so much of our attention and rightly so was on the COVID-19 crisis and the, the challenges that that presents to our economy and to our society. Um, I mean, I'm grateful to have the time to talk about the, the fintech sector in Northern Ireland and particularly the, the important role that I believe it can play as we look to reinvigorate our, our economy. A little bit of background maybe just to uh, my role as, as fintech envoy. In April 2016, the UK government um, set out some intentions around ensuring that uh, the regional growth of fintech um, across the UK, and one of the outworkings of that was to appoint regional envoys into those areas where there were existing hubs and growth potential for the, the fintech sector. Uh, and then in March of 2018, the UK government, through the Treasury Fintech Sector Strategy, announced that it would appoint fintech envoys in Wales and in Northern Ireland to complement those envoys already in place in, in England and in Scotland. Um, and in October then of, of last year, 2019, I was delighted um, to officially take up my role. And I carry out this role alongside my role as director at Arity, a startup company that was founded by the Austria Corporation uh, back in 2016. And I'm sure you're, you're all well aware of all state Northern Ireland's um, significant uh, presence here in, in Northern Ireland. Um, maybe before I go any further, I, I wanted just to take a moment or two to explain um, what fintech is. Um, how I like to describe fintech is where technology innovation uh, meets traditional financial services to make those services better, 
more efficient, more accessible to end users and consumers. So, for example, if you're used your smartphone or your tablet device for online banking or, or making a payment or, or moving money between your bank accounts or applying for a loan or even making a, a charitable donation, um, you've used you've used fintech, um, and I'm sure you're you're familiar with some of the the well-known household names like Starling, Monzo, Revolut, and Funding Circle, and so on. Um, but at the backbone um, of of fintech is technology, uh, financial service, and technology. So, like big data and analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cybersecurity, even blockchain, and all of these are well-established tech clusters uh, across Northern Ireland. And in my capacity as, as FinTech Envoy, I've made it my mission then to support and promote a sustainable, diverse and collaborative world-class FinTech sector across the province. But it's also my role as Envoy to ensure that I learn and share what's working in other regions, as it is for the other regional envoys to learn and share about what's working in Northern Ireland. And shortly after I took up my role in October 2019, I had the opportunity to present at the National FinTech Symposium in Glasgow. And it was a, it was a great opportunity. I was just um, very soon into the role. Uh, but I was able to talk about the world-class capabilities um, supporting the technology clusters in Northern Ireland. I talked about our burgeoning entrepreneurial ecosystem. I talked about the strong collaboration that we have between industry and academia around skills and research. I talked about the attractiveness of doing business and working and living in Northern Ireland. Um, and it's worth pointing out maybe just some, some statistics. Belfast is one of the top locations in the world for fintech development investment projects. Belfast is one of the top locations in Europe for foreign direct investment software development projects. And Belfast is the number one international location for US cybersecurity development projects. But probably most interesting of all, is that Northern Ireland was ranked number three in the Foreign Direct Investments FinTech Locations of the Future Report for 2019-2020. We sat just behind London and Singapore. In Northern Ireland, we have our, around 40,000 people employed, employed across financial and professional services sector, um, and around one in four of those are employed in technology roles. So in short, we have really a lot to, to feel proud about um, and to talk about. But there is no doubt the sector is facing some very significant challenges at the moment, not least the broader economic and societal upheavals we're seeing um, at the moment, and I suspect they're here for some time to come. Minister Dodds recently referenced FinTech alongside cybersecurity and our startup ecosystem as sectors to focus on as we look to revive the economy and emerge from the COVID-19 crisis. And I think it's also worth pointing out that fintech was largely born from the 2008 global financial crisis and has come a long way in 12 years. But I believe collect collectively we need to be ready and willing to address these challenges that face the sector and look at how we can protect what we've built as best we can and position ourselves for the opportunities that I believe can come um, if we can weather the storm. And with that, I'll back over to the Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and you've kind of finished a, on a point that, that I think is, is really relevant um, in the current context, I suppose, in relation to um, you know sectors that, even though you know much of the economy has had to close down, has you know um, managed to expand or you know to, to at least keep going, but also to, to expand in terms of, of cyber security, fintech, um, and, and all of that. Um, and obviously, um, we do need to be looking at how we can develop those further and how we can support those sectors um, to, to grow further. Um, in terms of that, though, the challenges that might be there um, in relation to skills and how we, we maybe need to, to look at what can be done in that um, respect um, and the role in that of uh, apprenticeships, for example. Um, is that something that the, the sector more broadly is um, open to and is, um, or, or has it already you know, put those kind of um, measures in place? Uh, because obviously you know, we have all these the issues um, in relation to you know, young people being particularly impacted by this crisis um, and needing to have alternative pathways open to, to young people in the time ahead. 
Yes, Chair, I, I agree. And actually, um, the contributions from from um, from previous um, people giving given evidence there was, was very is very relevant. Um, I mean, when, when we look at um, when we look at the, the numbers around the, the skills barometer, I think you know we're we're all aware that there there are areas that we are seeing are under supply, and that's engineering, technology, math, and computer science. Um, and then particularly, you know, um, that age group where you know around um, A levels to foundation degree, we're seeing an undersupply there as well. So I think we we have to be creative around um, around how we tailor our skills and development interventions um, to what skills we need in the future uh, and what job prospects there are out there. Um, around a third of of UK bound um, students from Northern Ireland go to Scotland, England and Wales and only a third of them will come back to live in Northern Ireland. So we've got a challenge around um, both, I believe, um, developing talent for the future, retaining talent, but also attracting back. Um, and you, you mentioned about higher apprenticeships. Um, the Oxford University um, has, has developed a financial technology part-time degree group our time degree program, which is part of the higher level apprenticeship uh, program. And I think that is a, is a great case in point for, for when um, academia and industry come together to solve a problem collectively, what, what it can come up with. Um, so I think that that, that, is, that course is, is, unique across, is, a, is unique across the UK. And I think those are exactly the types of um, collaborative um, efforts that we, need to be, that we need to be focusing on. Um, I do think, though, that we have we, apprenticeships generally, um, that we do have a little bit of a um, perception problem, and there's a little bit of myth busting that needs to happen there because, I mean, traditionally apprentice, apprenticeships have been seen as quite vocational. Um, but we're, we're, we're ever increasing the, the number of, of um, apprenticeship programs that we're building out in the accountancy, business administration, computer science, and now fintech. So. I think we, um, you know, we, we, we need to do we need to do a better sales job. I think around um, around the apprenticeship program and the and the, the resulting uh, job opportunities that um, that can arise from those. No, I agree totally with that point. I, I think that is something that it still needs um, a, a marketing job around in terms of apprenticeship and the real potential that there is through them. Um, and obviously, as well, some um, of the skills academies uh, have like. There's the example of Fintry um, and the skills academies that, that they have put in place um, as, a, as a really good model, I suppose, for people to, to reskill as well. Um, just uh, if you caught the end of the, the previous briefing, you will have maybe picked up on the, the piece around um, people who have, in this crisis, um, been able to work from home um, and the role of that, I suppose, going forward. Um, is that something that has been, you know, uh, of particular benefit to the fintech sector? Um, so I can speak from my my personal experience, and then um, what I'm hearing from from the sector. I mean, um, uh, Austria, Austria, Northern Ireland is, is the is the province's largest um, IT employer. Um, and over over the period of a couple of days, we um, we pretty much had moved. Um, all of our um, employees into a working from home environment, and in a, in a pretty in a pretty seamless way. Um, now, clearly, not not all companies have the the resources in order to do that. Um, but I think what it does demonstrate is that, um, and what we're seeing over over the last nine or ten weeks that we have been working from home, um, is that by and large, um, uh, it, it it seems to be working reasonably well. I think there will always be situations where you know people are, are trying to deal with their, their working from home arrangements and they have other commitments and they're trying to balance that. Um, but certainly we're, we're seeing no no significant um, decrease in terms of uh, productivity and by and large the working from home environment is, um, seems to be working okay. That said, it does present challenges for the longer term, you know, around people you know be feeling feeling isolated, um, you know maybe. People preferring to, to work in the office and have um, have their colleagues around them. I think it's something we have to keep a very um, a very close watch on, just in terms of what the longer term needs are of our employee base. There will always be people I think will feel more comfortable working in a in a in a office environment when the time is right. Um, but we're also seeing that there 
you know, there are many people that are, that are happy in the, in the working from home environment as well. I think across the sector, um, when we, you know, um, we're, we're the, the sector in many respects, um, because of the way in which it's set up, um, doesn't necessarily need to operate from an office environment, assuming that the you know, people have the, the, the right logistics and technology and things like that to work effectively from home. So in that, in, in that, in that way, um, we, we have um, been quite fortunate. Convinced a, a lot of particularly employers, but employees as well, of the, the the benefits of working from home and that it actually can work. Um, and uh, just to pick up on a point from our previous discussion there with um, ICTU as well around the, the you know the right to disconnect. Um, has that something that the, the sector has looked at in any um, significant way? Um, again, I mean, it's something. Um, it's it's something from a from a um, an employer perspective. That we're, we're we're very conscious of um, because there's there's no clear boundary for those that are working from home. There's no clear boundary between their home life and their office life. Um, and I think there are a lot of kind of techniques um, that can be employed to try and create that separation between um, between work and home life. Some you know some are quite easy to implement, and some of them can be quite uh, quite difficult. But protecting Protecting particular periods during the day, um, that that lunch hour, and you know that is the golden hour where where you just shut shut down your your laptop or computer and you um, and you 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 just tune out from from work and maybe go out for a walk or, or do do something just to take your mind off and get a bit of fresh air um, and just help with your your mental and physical well being. Um, I think we we are we are as a as a virtual organisation. I think we're more conscious of the fact. Um, that um, uh, that we are we are working from home, and people tend to be a little bit more um, tuned into that, and maybe provide a little bit more flexibility um, and be and be more conscious. I think interestingly, um, it, it has been a, a leveler in some respects, particularly for large multi uh, multinational organisations, where um, where maybe um, where we have you have offshore offices. Everybody is now. Um, everybody's now working from home and in some respects that has been a bit of a leveller for us. Thank you. Um, Sinead? Sinead? We, lost, we might have lost her again. Sinead? Do you want to go on to the next one? Uh, we'll move on and, and we'll come back to Sinead. John Stewart? Thanks, Chair. Am I working? Yep. You're working from home there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, good to speak to you again. Uh, I enjoyed our conversation last week, I think it was, just getting the flavour for um, FinTech and the great work you're doing. So it's nice to speak to you again. Um, I know we discussed uh, a number of issues that day, but I would be just, um, if you could maybe start by just outlining specifically why you think Northern Ireland is such a great hub for FinTech itself and the strengths and maybe the diversification that we have here to make this such a, an important sector and one that can really grow in Northern Ireland. Thanks, John. Yeah, good to, good to talk to you again. Um, I mean, I think when you, um, when, when you listen to, to companies, um, why, why, they, why they come here to set up um, or why they choose to, uh, to grow here, there, there's a number of Different factors that are cited time and time again, um, and what, one of them is is the is the highly educated workforce that we have and the talent skills pool. Um, another is is the the attractive business environment, um, local government support, um, and our strong infrastructure. Um, but I think um, beyond beyond that, I, I think we we we're in somewhat of a unique position. I think if you know if you if you look at the if you look at that the the map that is in your briefing pack there. Um, the Northern Ireland uh, FinTech ecosystem map, you'll see that there is a, a significant representation of companies across um, what, we, what, what we see as the, as the FinTech ecosystem um, in, in Northern Ireland. Companies, large, well-established companies like, you know, like Barclays and Aflac, Ulster Bank, Ulster and so on, down to um, what, we, what we have that currently identified is around 30 startup scale-up companies. And then those institutions that are providing the skills and the talent, the digital hubs that are supporting the, the, the startup and scale um, ecosystem, um, 
a you know myriad of, of, of organizations that are helping provide funding and then those companies that are providing advisory and support services. And I think for what is a relatively, you know, relatively speaking, a small region of the UK, we are very well represented all across that, that ecosystem. Um, on top of that, then, you've got some of our very fast technology and um, clusters that I've mentioned before, um, you know, like cybersecurity, like artificial intelligence and machine learning, and like big data and analytics. And they're providing the backbone for so many of the um, so many of the of the of the fintech companies um, here. So I think we've got a, a rich mix of of companies. We've got a a, a well represented ecosystem. And I think when, when companies are coming to, to invest in Northern Ireland, they oftentimes look at what's already there and they think, well, if those companies have chosen to take a risk and are setting up or expanding in Northern Ireland, then a lot of the risk associated with doing that has, has been taken away. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen that recently with, you know, the announcements from Risk Connect and, and Vox Financial and Signet, um, all very welcome, all very welcome um, entry, entries into the, into the Northern Ireland economy. Thank you. I think it is really exciting. I know these are very difficult times with COVID and, and the implications around Brexit and things and the instability that maybe say COVID is providing to the economy. But certainly the excite, there is excitement and the potential for the sector here, the fintech sector. I think it is massive and it is one that Northern Ireland can become proud of. I think we have the conditions are right, the people are there, um, the infrastructure is in place um, and it wouldn't be hard to get it perfect. In a, in a perfect position. So um, I welcome the fact that you're in post now and um, certainly we'll be here, we'll be able to support in any way we can. Um, and I think it will go from strength to strength. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and thanks, Andrew, uh, for that presentation. It was very uh, useful. And obviously we can hear the, the passion uh, that you have for the sector. But also I think that uh, it's just good to hear uh, some real positive news and about the fact that you know, Northern Ireland is punching well uh, above its weight in terms of where it sits within this sector. So I, I think that's very encouraging and also obviously to hear some of the reasons why uh, companies would choose here as a destination uh, for that. I, I think that we need to do more in that respect. And I suppose that that's where maybe my question lies. Um, I, you know, uh, how, how do you ensure that you can you can get um, the, the, you know the fintech sector right across uh, all of Northern Ireland? We know that many of us have been forced into using uh, new technologies even during this current crisis because you know people are now using their phones uh, to pay for items, and I think that, that that's good and that that's the way forward. Um, but. Where then are there the gaps? What, what are the weaknesses? Where, what do we need to do next to further the sector? Obviously, we're doing things well at the moment, but how do we get to that next stage? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. So I, I think there, um, there, there, are, there are a few things that you, you, you pointed out. Um, there, there, in, in my mind, there, there are opportunities as we, as we come out the other side. I mean, some, uh, some fundamental things have, are, have changed over these last number of months. Consumer behaviour is changing. Um, you know, we've, we've all, I think, um, become more uh, digitally literate um, over, over, the last, over the last couple of months. Um, but if you think about that from a broader perspective, we're seeing, you know, um, I think a, a speeding up of digital transformation. Um, we're seeing more digital online solutions. We're seeing new lending models appear. We're seeing the increased use of payment platforms, and all, all of those things are are good, and um, because they represent potential opportunities for, for for fintech. But to your point, there 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 are challenges, and we you know we cannot cannot lose sight of that. Um, as much as there is opportunity and potential, there are challenges that um, that we do face. And I think one thing to to think about is um, a, a lot of fintech startup scale companies in the fintech sector are less than ten years old. Um, so they may not even be at that point where they where they're healthy in terms of, of profit. Many are still dependent on um, funding from investors. Um, they may not be cash rich. They may have limited you know um, cash runway, um, and they may not have the option even to, to furlough because they're, they're they're too small. So I think um, there a lot of those are not necessarily specific to 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 fintech startups, but I think they are they are you know broadly applicable to startup companies across across the board. 
So I think we need to be conscious of that. I think we, we've done a lot of good work around um, around funding and access to, to finance in terms of you know the future fund and the business support grant, the bounce back loans and the hardship funds. I think all of those have been hugely beneficial and well received. But I think what we need to do is, is continue to look at how we can best support those those companies, particularly those startup scale up companies that are um, high growth, high potential, and help them to navigate what sometimes can be a very complicated um, uh, mix of of funding and support packages um, available to them. So I think that's one thing. I think another thing we need to do is, is recognise that, um, and it kind of comes back to skills and talent, but this is more around diversity and inclusion. Um, we 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 have too few females in in the fintech uh, sector across across the board. We you know around 30% um, of of the employee base are females. Even fewer number are 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 are, are female founders and leaders. Um, around 17 percent um, are are leaders of fintech organisations. Around five percent are are founders. And it's really not surprising, um, although regrettable, but really not surprising when you think about you're bringing together financial services and technology, which are two kind of not very diverse organisations um, sectors to begin with. So we need to do more around encouraging. Um, encouraging females into into taking some STEM subjects, and then and then helping draw the link between those types of subjects um, and maybe more around you know engineering, technology, mass computer science, and the jobs that are out there um, and available uh, in the sector. Because I think there's still a perception that in, within the technology sector, it is you're sitting in front of a computer writing code for you know 37 or 40 hours a week. And that, that is not the case. There's a broad range of, of roles and career opportunities um, available um, across the sector. So I think those are the those are the, the maybe the three things we talked about: skills and talent. We've talked about you know I've mentioned about funding and access to finance, and I think then setting part of talent and skills, but certainly needing dedicated focus is around diversity and inclusion. Thanks, Chair. And just very briefly, uh, obviously this is another area where it just goes right across departments, right across sectors, and we need to uh, try and uh, bring that all together. And I know that's partly uh, your role, and, and you, you will do that and champion that. And absolutely, uh, I think that we need to support you in, in, in that effort. Uh, but are you seeing, Andrew, in terms of employers and working with schools, are you starting to see, certainly I, I would see it in terms of a change of attitude as to you know what line of work you know, we, we should be encouraged to go on to? Yeah, I, I, I think it takes it takes deliberate action on the heart on the on the part of employers um, and on behalf of of schools, um, you know, careers, teachers, government, and even the individuals themselves um, to help uh, create more awareness around um, you know around around what those opportunities are. And there, and there are some there are some great programs um, both in Northern Ireland and, and across the UK around how we can I, and I think make make those opportunities create more awareness around those opportunities um, um, and and help help draw the link between the studies that individuals are taking on and what the and, and what the jobs are at the at the other end. So, you know, programs where we can help build. Uh, soft skills um, and the skills that are needed for people for for young people to be successful in employment is is quite a is quite a is quite broad. But then specifically, and if we think about fintech and technology, because the two things are so intertwined, how we can actually bring technology bring technology into the classroom in a way that um, you know that can help uh, you know school children understand financial services, whether that's you know taking out bank, you know how to start a bank account, how to look after their money, think, things like that. And there's some there's some work happening in, in England. I think those are opportunities for for maybe for us to look at how we can replicate um, how we can replicate something here. Thank you. Um, I think that that piece then around um, diversity and inclusion um, and uh, visibility, I suppose of. Um, particularly women in, in some of those roles is really important. Um, I know the, the Matrix Women in STEM um, report, I think it's about two years old now, um, hi, uh, really highlighted the, the importance of that. I think something that we should pick up because there was a suggestion, a recommendation out of it for a cross-departmental working group 
on STEM, um, and that's something that, that you know, I think that would be important that we picked up on. Sure, we also have briefing on the skills strategy coming up in the next number of weeks, and that's an issue that's been identified in this briefing and pretty much every briefing um, that the committee's had over the last number of weeks in terms of re-gearing where skills are going, what skills are on offer, you know, as you say, ap uh, application to apprenticeships and so on. Yeah. Um, Sinead? Sinead? <laughs> oh, we thought she'd got back in. Uh, hello, can you oh, hear me? Oh, oh, there she go goes, ahead. There she goes. <laughs> yes. Hello? Yes? Yeah. I'm, I don't really know what's wrong here, but anyway, um, <laughs> it seems to be going in and out. But However, um, no, um, Andrew, good to hear from you. And it's good to actually hear uh, positivity around uh, a growing um, market, um, particularly here for Northern Ireland. And I think COVID-19 underlines just the importance of fintech, particularly in emerging markets. Um, uh, and financial inclusion is extremely important, um, uh, uh, particularly during this uh, pandemic. But fundamentally, to, to, to fintech and, uh, and its growth, um, it is been able to access broadband uh, uh, and to have that capacity. Um, ha have you been um, speaking to, you know, uh, to providers in relation how how we in Northern Ireland can actually improve our bro broadband access? Because I think it is an essential. It's nearly like a utility now uh, requirement, uh, particularly if we if we are looking to develop um, the fintech sector uh, and services. Uh, and that's not just particularly to Northern Ireland. It's, it's right across the world. Um, and we've also spoken uh, in the past as well, Andrew, just about your relationship with um, higher education and further education institutions. And is there anything that we, um, as an economy committee, can do um, to help support um, your industry going forward in, in relation to, to improving um, access uh, for, your ex uh, for your sector to, to, the, um, to these institutions? Uh, thanks for the question, Sheila. I'll, I'll maybe take the second question first, if that's, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I've spoken, I've had some um, time with um, officials from um, the Department of the Economy to talk talk about, you know, the, where, where we are in terms of talent and skills and um, and how we can, and to, to this, was, this point was raised by, um, in the previous session, around how we, how we marry up uh, the skills and talent needs with um, with policy and how we you know how we're all kind of driving in the right direction. So I think um, there's there, there's there's clearly good work happening there. I think there's clearly more work that needs to be done so that we're we're more joined up in terms of um, the the talent that we're that we are the talent pipeline that we are building and ensuring that they have the right skills um, and they um, the right the right um, well, the right the right skills for the future um, and. I was um, I attended um, the the launch of the, the financial uh, services skills task force uh, task force report um, uh, earlier this earlier this year, um, and it speaks to the to these very things. We we, we need um, to be encouraging um, our young people um, and our um, prospective employees, of, you know, um, to build what are called future based skill sets, um, and part of that has been able to. Um, you know, to adapt, being able to adapt and, and demonstrate how, how you can be agile in your learning so that if you start out on one career path, um, you have the support uh, to be able to move from one career path to the next. And sometimes that can be across, you know, that can be across sectors as, as well. So I think there's, there's a lot of good work happening within the, within, the, um, uh, within the department. I think there's more we can do to tailor the training more closely to what the, the sector the sector needs and I think that's where part, part of it goes back to the higher level apprenticeship program and how we can actually make that more appealing um, to people that are um, that are that are considering what the next step in their in their career path uh, in their career path is um, I think to, to to your first to your first question um, in, in terms of broadband infrastructure you know obviously it's not something I've specifically um, been um, um, been involved in, uh, but I think you know you're, you're probably aware that you know a, a lot of the broadband providers um, across the UK lifted lifted their 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 the caps um, on their um, you know, for those who've had uh, data data caps in place, which I think was a, a very welcome 
um, move move from them um, because it helps. It obviously helps alleviate some of the potential um, costs associated with people, you know, using their their, their broadband um, networks from from home. I suppose, Andrew, what I'm really saying, uh, just more simply, is that a lot of your industry are now working from home, and, and there are some people that are probably living in rural areas and finding it difficult to actually uh, do their job because they haven't got the, the appropriate broadband provision, uh, etc. And that is that is a problem, um, as I say, just particularly in, in rural areas, and we need to kind of address that because we can't have any barriers for um, your industry at this particular moment in time. I, I absolutely agree with you on that, and I mean, there's some, um, there, there's obviously there, there's there's ways around it, but I, I, I agree with you, Sinead. I think um, you know having having that access to uh, to broadband is 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 critically important. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Hello, Andrew. It's good to talk to you, and look forward to meeting you soon. Um, yeah, I haven't been around the economy issues for some time. I'm very much aware of. Businesses like Allstate that come in here and have been great advocates for Northern Ireland and uh, certainly have uh, seemed to have found a good home here and are great ambassadors, especially in the States, for, for this province and, and bringing technology here. Um, again, I would endorse what has been said about Northern Ireland being a good place for for business. Uh, the cyber security thing is something that comes up regularly. They have developers have come into my office talking about it, wanting to look at potential sites to develop for um, businesses involved in cyber security. So I think there's a lot of potential there. The question would be, is Invest NI doing as much as they can to, to bring forward businesses like this? Obviously, COVID-19 has taken away the focus for them on a lot of their business and, and uh, how we can I uh, suppose uh, signpost them again to try and, and bring in new people I think is important so I would like your opinion on that and uh, I suppose R&D funding is something as well that we've talked about a lot in this committee over the years uh, how we we uh, source that and, and the importance of that I think is critical to to your business especially and to supporting businesses as they bring forward new initiatives and new ways of working, especially in, in, in research. So I would appreciate your comments on those points, Andrew. So I, I think, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think in terms of um, in, in best in eyes, um, they're, they're acutely aware of the, um, of the first of all, the, the presence of the financial services technology sector already in Northern Ireland and to my mind, have done a really, a really good job in, in encouraging um, additional, additional companies in here, but also supporting, um, you know, supporting um, incumbents. Um, and I think you only need to look at, you know, the, the three quite recent um, job uh, companies coming in to, to see to see that. Um, there's a there's a, a representative body um, in Northern Ireland called the FinTech Northern Ireland Association, and it, it is it is comprised of a number of um, different um, representative uh, groups and, and um, Invest and I are on that and, and they're on that for, for a reason um, because it's important that they understand and hear the voice of the sector in Northern Ireland um, and then can act as an advocate for, for how the sector can, can continue to grow um, and develop here. So I think um, you know, Invest Northern Ireland have, have, um, have, have been very supportive of the sector in the past and um, certainly through my lens, continue to be. Um, I think in terms of, of research and development, um, I, I mean, the, the research and development is, is integral to, to how we continue to build and develop technology solutions. Um, and we have, uh, without, without the focus on R&D, I don't think we would have the, the technology clusters that we've, that we've built today. So it will continue to be an integral part of um, keep, uh, keeping us ahead of the game um, and providing new solutions, new products into the future. Obviously, the challenges of uh, post Brexit, and uh, we're, we're very much aware of the spin off from the ERDF fund, which was used extensively by, obviously by the universities and, uh, and all our major businesses 
in Northern Ireland, how that is going to be replaced, I think will be a challenge. And obviously, funding like that is, is important for the future of development of your, your business. It, it, it absolutely is. And I think that is, you know, the Minister Dodds has, has um, you know, um, clearly clearly set out the TC's FinTech along with the technology clusters as, as core to the revival economy. And I think, you know, how we can continue to, to fund R&D initiatives is going to be integral to that. Okay, Andre, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, thank you for your, your presentation. One of the things that I've always thought uh, has been a major failing in, in our education system is we, didn't, we don't start teaching languages until you get to secondary school. Um, similarly, in terms of the sorts of services and investment that you're seeking, I don't think we're doing enough to be teaching coding in our schools. I'm just wondering if I could take your, your view on that, because as you say, this is a rapidly cyber security and cyber business in general, rapidly expanding area. But in order to help it to expand further, I think we need to be skilling people um, at a very young age, starting them, uh, exposing them to that sort of um, technology and education. I'm just wanting to take your view on that. Absolutely, the question, Chris. I I agree with you. I think um, the the maybe the education interventions, for want of a better term, um, how, aren't aren't early enough. Hmm. Um, I mean, our I, I have a, I have an 11 year old um, who, given given him the opportunity, would spend most most of his time playing Minecraft on his um, on his iPad. Uh, but he, he's getting work from his teacher and getting getting projects um, from. Um, from from school to do to keep them um, you know to keep them busy, so we we have we have a generation of um, by and large very digitally literate um, digitally literate kids, um, and I think we need to um, we need to harness that, um, and I, it kind of goes back to a point I made earlier around um, t teaching technology in schools is one thing, but actually linking the technology to real world problems to solve. Is where I think is the is the exciting piece, because you can teach someone to code and the principles of coding or developing software, but I think they're you know it's it's difficult to spark their excitement and their and their enthusiasm um, unless they have a real world problem to solve, and I think that is where we that is where you know we, we need to maybe spend more more focus and effort and um, and and getting getting our, our young people exposed to. Uh, technology, but also the potential to solve, you know, you know, world global problems um, using the technology that they have at their disposal now. Long gone are the days where, where you know, in order to develop software, you have to you have to be in a in an office environment with um, and link to all sorts of computers. You know, anybody now can develop a a, a computer program um, at home um, with very little very little hardware. So the means are there. I think we just need to be thoughtful around. You know how how we can put the structures in place, um, and in, and you know expose our young people to that technology at an earlier stage in their in their in their lives. Thank you, um, John. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation uh, and, and answers thus far. Uh, it's been very informative. I suppose your uh, sector, and as the chair mentioned earlier on around home working. Your sector is a sector which many other businesses and industries uh, could learn from in terms of how we move forward into what is the new normal and work practices, uh, working, working at a distance or, or working from home, whatever way it's referred to. Um, are, are, is your sector involved in the strategic forum uh, which has been set up by the economy minister uh, in regards a partnership between uh, the trade union sector uh, industry manufacturers, etc. Um, I, I I can't I can't speak um, um, categorically for that, John. Um, I, there there may there may be there may be members um, of the sector that are involved in it, but I'm just not I'm not aware of who they might be. But it's something I can take back to the FinTech Northern Ireland Association um, to find out some more about. No, I appreciate that. And in regards to another matter, um, you refer to you as Belfast as being a, an international hub uh, for, for fintech. Can we expand beyond Belfast? Um, the the needs of the economy across 
uh, needs will be obviously adapting to the new realities which will come after uh, the pandemic and the most likely the recession that's coming with it. And I suspect your, your industry is going to be key to that economic uh, stability and, and indeed recovery. How do we expand beyond, beyond Belfast to ensure that there's a fair distribution of jobs, resources uh, across the north? Thanks for the question, John. So, um, well, I suppose in, to, to answer your question, the good news is that we have already expanded the sector. The, the sector is well represented outside of um, outside of Belfast. You know, we've got the likes of Fin True and Alchemy up in um, up in up in the northwest, um, who are adding a lot into the the local economies there. Um, when I my my first official appointment actually t after I I was um, I, I took up the envoy role was to the northwest to visit um, Brian McGrath and the Derry London Dairy Chamber of Commerce because um, I wanted to make sure that as I took on the role it didn't appear that I was only interested and focused on what was happening in Belfast in the greatest Bel greater Belfast area um, and we have representation from the northwest. Um, through um, through the the, chain, the dairy London Dairy Team of Commerce on the Northern on the FinTech Northern Ireland Association, so we're 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 very um, we're very aware of the of the bridges that we need we need to continue to create um, across different parts of the province, um, and make sure that when when we're talking about when I'm talking about FinTech, um, I'm not just talking about FinTech in Belfast. Um, when the Lord Mayor of the City of London, William Russell, was over in in Northern Ireland. Um, Towards the end of last year, he spent time up in um, up in the northwest as well, um, and met with some of the fintech companies, FinTru and, and some others while he was while he was there. So I think there's a there's a recognition that the sector is well. It, there's a there's obviously a very significant cluster around Belfast. There's representation um, across other parts of the the province as well. Yeah, and just lastly, it's as much a comment as it is a question or. But as former education minister, just following on from Christopher's comments and others' comments about the link with education, when I'm looking at, at, at your map, the names that jump out at me are those that were proactive in engaging with me as minister with the department, but particularly with schools in their facilities, uh, who, who went into the schools, whether it's primary schools or, or post-primary schools, and engaged with the pupils and the teachers around uh, the opportunities that existed uh, within your industry. So I, I, would and I know many of them do, but I would encourage uh, th those who are aligned to you to, to reach I know they're all very, very busy people, and this is just adding work to them, but the best way to make your presence known is to reach out to your local schools and engage with them, and, and the, the rewards will be there for the schools and also for your industry. Yeah, I, I agree with you, John. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I first-hand experience of of speaking with with school principals and um, and talking through the opportunities that you know the, the the tech sector and the broader fintech sector has. So, the more we can do to engage proactively with those schools, and indeed, the more those schools can proactively engage with us, I think the better off we're going to be in the long run, just in terms of of awareness um, and breaking down some of those myths that exist. Um, particularly within the, the tax sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrew, thank you very much for joining us this morning, and we will um, take forward some of the, the um, suggestions that were made in the, con in the course of that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Committee. It was good to talk to you, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Okay, then, members, moving on to um, matters arising. Um, so. We have a letter from the Minister, item 6.1, at page 22 of your pack, um, outlining the government's intention to make an EU exit statutory instrument with all professional qualification and services miscellaneous provisions, EU exit regulations 2020. The proposed regulations will implement provisions concerning the recognition of professional qualifications in the EU withdrawal agreement. The Minister proposes that, as has been established practice, um, provision will be made um, for the North in the UK statutory instrument. Um, and the letter is there. Um, Peter, I was wondering if we could maybe just explore where that sits in terms of the, con and the context of the, the protocol um, negotiations and the mutual recognition of qualifications across the island. If I can give you what my understanding is, the regulations themselves effectively take us through to the end of the transition period where 
technically we're not in the EU anymore. Well, in really reality, we're not in the EU anymore. Um, so this continues while we're in the transition period to offer that mutual recognition. There hasn't been anything um, clear come out of the protocol. The expectation would be that going forward, any new free trade agreements, this is something that's generally discussed, so there's mutual recognition across that. So at the minute, there isn't clarity on what the protocol, the impact that will actually have, or whether there is a protocol impact. The protocol essentially deals with um, goods. There's further discussion beyond it into services. There's a lot of nuance it just doesn't touch. So absolutely, that's not clear and is something if they if members are content what i do is try and pinpoint just where that will go whether it's going to be different for us under the protocol compared to to um you know gb or whatever going forward so absolutely yeah if members are content i'll do that um, then item 6.2 there is a letter from the minister to students um are members content to, to note mm -hmm. that in Fair. relation to um, the offers of uncon or unconditional offers to, to students here. Um, okay, thank you. Then um, 6.3, there is communication from the Minister for, for Finance um, in relation to the self-employment income support scheme and the identity check. So it's there for members to read unless there's any Chair, further action. I'm still getting responses from our MPs. They're all working hard on this when there, there's um, unity across the piece in, in fixing that. It's still um, not bottomed out, no chair, sure, really, no, is it? I, I'm not 100% sure why it's taking this sort of time. I don't. Um, but, my understanding is people are getting things sorted when they ring the phone number, but, but still, it's getting through on the phone number. There's lengthy right. waiting times on the phone number as well. Yeah, that's our experience as well. In a recent case, a person had to hold on for 40 odd minutes, but eventually got there. But that well, seems to be very the frustrating. Only route. Yeah. Very frustrating. Um, it might be worth trying. There's an email that has come through to members this morning okay. from the DOF uh, private office okay. in relation to it that they are continuing to work on it as well. It went to all MLAs. Because I'm assuming, Chair, sort of helplines never great. We've seen that across so many different things. So uh, an online technical solution would be better. Where, you know, obviously lots of people can log in at one time. So I'm assuming uh, maybe that's you know the ultimate goal. But um, if if members could forward, if any member could forward the um, the DOF private office, that would just be useful. So we have for records and we can yeah. um, see what leaves us. But as I say, the MPs are still coming back and talking about. Uh, there's a fair bit of activity there. Yep. Um, then moving on to 6.4, there is cars. Oh no, sorry, did I miss one? 6.4. No, no, um, yeah, there is correspondence from the committee for community. Oh, sorry. No, hang on. 6.4 down at the bottom of page four. Um, contact details. Yeah, 28 page yeah, 28. Bottom of page four. Sure, Stefan. Yeah, but the 6.4 is the response from the department. Um, hang on. Um, for on contact details. Yes. Yes. Point of contact. Yes, that's it. That's the one. Sorry, so, Chair. Yeah. Um, and that's now evolved. Yes. So, you wanna uh, so to Chair, as I understand it, um, the there's been an approach made to um, whips to the business committee in terms of highlighting people within departments who are contact points. In the case of the Department for the Economy, that's the minister's private secretary. So uh, what I'll do at the end of the meeting is circulate those details so that everybody has them. So that's your direct point of contact um, with the department in terms of queries, issues, questions and so on. Um, but as I say, I will I will send those contact details around um, after the meeting. Yep. Um, Can we have the, the contact details for the, the Dallo as well? We have those, but this this is the minister's PS. Is the is yeah, the, I think we is got the contact? That. I think we all got um, one for all the departments. We should have, yeah. I think some departments it's the Dallow, some departments it's the PS or private office. But for economy, it's the PS. Chair, this was discussed at the business committee, and I know the whips got the information. It was part of the facts. Uh, and absolutely right. I think that in some cases, the assembly liaison officer is going to be the point of contact, but the speaker. 
written to the executive office to get clarity, and that was the list that they came back with was for ourselves. It's the private office. So, so we await Peter's response. I have those details. I will be <laughs> whizzing them to you. And don't be in at 11.30 tonight for your own good. <laughs> no, it'll be immediately after this meeting. Right. Just working from oh, home, Lara. Right. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, so moving on then, there is a 6.5, a response from the department in relation to um, private international law, uh, the question that we put to them about um, what, it, what it meant. So if members are content to note that. Great. Um, then 6.6, .6, there is a response from the department in relation to the resumption of um, events. Um, it was in relation to the events sector that we had a briefing on. So are members content to note that one? Mm -hmm. 6.7 yeah. then, there is um, a response from the department in relation to comment of the on correspondence regarding um, employment law. Are members content to note that? Yeah. Great. Um, 6.8 then, there is a response from the department um, on um, a query a bit to them around the, the taxi industry and the impact of COVID-19. Um, and it's you know quite a, a comprehensive response in relation to that one. Chair, if members are content, we share that um, with other relevant committees. Um, committee for yeah. infrastructure. Um, that's been an issue that's been very live for them uh, and, and generally continues to be. Happy to do that. Six point nine. Then there is a response from the department um, on communication from the chair of the bar council. Um, members can to note that or have any actions. Great. Um, then 6.10, um, response from the department um, to the committee's request for comment and correspondence from the Committee for Infrastructure regarding financial pressures on the logistics sector. Um, do members have any suggestions in relation to that? Chair, again, if we share that yep. um, with infrastructure, that would be useful for them. Um, then 6.11 is a discussion paper from Ulster University's Economic Policy Centre um, on the potential impact and consequences of COVID-19. Um, Peter, we thought maybe we could... This is, yeah, this is the one, Chair, um, that we talked about previously and uh, if members are still um, content, we will seek a briefing on it. Yeah. Um, I know the work is evolving. Um, any of those papers are essentially a snapshot of what is known at that time. So. What I was thinking was, because members have that now, if we maybe leave it a couple of weeks, then we'll have a better idea of where things are ultimately going to go. There'll be further work done. I know the unit is in constant um, contact with the executive and they're constantly updating what they do. So we're, we're looking at trying to get that into the next couple of weeks. Yeah, great. Um, and then 6.12 is um, the Labour Relations Agency paper that they had spoke about last week on um, mental health and workplace yeah. together people programme is there for members to have um, a look at. And sure, that's published on their website as well. So we have flagged it up. Um, it's it's a chair as as was said at the time. It's a very good um, reference document for a lot of businesses. I think as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, moving on then to item number seven, it's the LCM and the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 72, the Corporate Insolvency Governance Bill LCM at page 74. The revised LCM has been provided at page three of the table pack. Chair, sure, it's just important, important for me to flag up. The revised LCM didn't actually change any provision. There was a date typo in the original, which said 2012, which should have said 2021. And there was also a typo in the title used. Those were fine in the revised version, and the motion we were moving from was was correct. There was no typo in that. So, materially, nothing has really changed. Okay. Um, so, the corporate corporate government sorry corporate governance and insolvency bill, as introduced, is at page eighty four of the pack. The clauses extended to here are at page 322. The delegated powers memorandum is at page 325. Explanatory notes at page 395. A written submission from Enterprise NI at page 459. And a written submission from the Irish League of Credit Unions at page 460. Um, the, the committee... So the, the, um, L the committee has been awaiting the LCM um, being laid in the business office and has now and has received a briefing 
um, on the 6th of May from the FE Insolvency Service. The bill was laid in the business office on Thursday the 21st of May, following the bill being introduced in the House of Commons on Wednesday the 20th of May. Um, the, the committee has written to relevant stakeholders and requested submissions in regards to the information available at the time um, to the committee and has received two submissions that we've outlined there above. Um, and they have been outlined in the draft committee report. The draft committee report is at page 11 of your table papers. The clerk will outline a summary of the report and then questions. Chair, can I just immediately thank uh, Enterprise NI and the Irish League of Credit Unions who um, turned around responses in the fastest time certainly I've ever experienced. Hmm. Um, in terms of, of this being laid and actually turning around a report um, I can't honestly think of a faster or shorter time scale ever. So thank you to all those who contributed. I know it was difficult in that the initial information we gave the stakeholders wasn't the um, published le legislative memorandum, uh, legislative consent memorandum at the time, because that hadn't been published. We had to go with what we got, um, knowing there was going to be a really short time scale. So that help was invaluable. Um, Chair, if I could just give a, a bit of an outline on, on where we are. The, the Minister had indicated that the short time scale and the reason for bringing this was to allow businesses here to have the same protections um, because of the COVID-19 the COVID impact as in GB. That was the reason for bringing it quickly and to do it as quickly as was required. Um, legislative consent motion was the fastest option. Legislating locally even in an accelerated way, would have still taken an awful lot longer. This has been turned around in a matter of weeks. Um, in terms of our consideration, as the Chair has mentioned, we, we had briefing from officials on the 6th. The um, committee have talked about this um, a number of subsequent occasions, which was one of the reasons why we were particularly targeting um, specific stakeholders, including um, the, the Irish League of Credit Unions, who have come back, the provisions of the bill and the legislative consent motion as are, are welcomed by both. Um, what both have flagged up um, is subsequent um, regulations and so on, and potential um, lengthening, and lengthening out of time scales, mm -hmm. which would be in the gift of our own minister within certain time parameters. So in terms of the actual legislative consent memorandum, the bill as it stands, they have no um, substantive change to make, no real change to make. So the committee is in the position now where essentially what I'm inviting members to consider is whether they're willing to come to the conclusion, and I'm quoting this from page 28 of the table pack, which is, is the last page of the, the LCM report itself. So the conclusion is paragraph 88. Uh, on the basis of the very limited time available to the committee to scrutinise this legislative consent motion, and bearing in mind the Minister's view that it is necessary for the legislation to be undertaken by the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy to ensure that local businesses are protected to the same degree as those in GB, and to do this through the Assembly would take a much longer process, the Committee for the Economy agrees to support this legislative consent motion. Uh, the committee would ask that the Minister urgently engage with sh stakeholders, particularly the Irish League of Credit Unions, to hear and address the concerns they have with regard to the bill and legislative consent motion. Now, as I say, those are subsequent. The motion and bill itself, they are content. Um, the other issues can be addressed post-legislation. So this will be debated on Tuesday for approval. Um, so essentially where we are, if, if you want to go back to the brief, yeah. is agreeing the paragraphs 1 to 87, which are the what the bill does, the engagement that the committee had, and then 88 and 89, which are conclusion, I consent with the um, advocacy for the um, minister to engage with stakeholders who have flagged up a uh, desire for continued dialogue. Can I ask a question? Go right ahead. Um, in relation to clause 16 of the bill, Let me go back. which um, it prevents the supplier relying on any clause in a contract which would entitle the supplier to terminate the contract or the supply, um, and it has extended it from um, utility services to other goods and services. 
I just wanted to get some clarification on what um, protection is there for the suppliers um, and what is the kind of role of credit insurance in terms of that? So the beauty of this will be that the protections that apply to the end supplied business will also apply to the supplier themselves, if that makes sense. So everybody has the same protection, therefore, um, if I can put this probably in a term that wouldn't be legal, well not, <laughs> not legal but you know what I mean, um, it nullifies the situation because everyone's protected to an equal degree. Um, so it's not that the, the end supplied to business has the protection, but the supplier or someone further down the chain doesn't have the protection. Everybody has the protection going through, so it's been done in a vertical way. Um, members will recall we've discussed this in the context of other situations in, in recovery and rebuilding where you have to move as an entire vertical supply chain rather than, you know, taking that bit or whatever. In terms of the um, credit, uh, what was it you described it as? Insurance. Credit insurance. We've talked, we've engaged with the um, ABI, Association of Insurers, um, to clarify this, and they have clarified the point on the trade insurance. I personally have no expertise and that didn't understand it, but it was passed on to the stakeholders we've engaged with who accepted that. What we've also written into our forward work programme is further engagement with the ABI to understand more how that um, actually works out. But our understanding and response from stakeholders in the limited time we had was that the clause as written is sufficient and that any um, issues that arise can be dealt with uh, with this initial piece of legislation. Okay. So yeah, regulations can that still... Be, that's scheduled to be changed, doesn't it? Yes. The, um, the Minister has a certain number of abilities around issuing different regulations and amending that aren't all contingent on um, the same being done elsewhere. There, there are, hence why it's a legislative consent motion, there, there are abilities for, particularly here because we have more... Um, devolved room for manoeuvre than Scotland or Wales. So the Minister can make subsequent changes where that is necessary. And there are exclusions to it as well, including for smaller companies, isn't that? Yes, right? yes. Um, again, there aren't necessarily particular issues foreseen with that, with this first piece of legislation. And I think, again, that's why the Minister has the ability to um, further regulate because we've seen this, Chair, with pretty much all of the fast legislation that's gone through, there have been unintended consequences. So this has written in the ability to regulate further because of that. So those kinds of issues are key to monitoring. Um, and also the fact that these this has pre-written um, sunset clauses. So it ends completely. I think the sunset clause is actually further away than what ENI were. It is, but the minister has other built-in um, variation points where things can be done within uh, generally on three-month periods. Um, but again, as, as the minister can make new regulations, and that's done in cooperation with the the um, business secretary, but not. Um, having to be done jointly with, if you know what I mean. The Minister can do it, and as long as it's compliant, then she can go ahead and make those regulations. Okay. So, ideally, we would have wanted to take this apart, um, but literally this is being debated on Tuesday, and this is kind of our opportunity now. Um, from what we've got from stakeholders, there's a level of, of satisfaction that this is necessary, um, and not perfect, but necessary uh, in terms of getting that protection into place, which will backdate to the 1st of March. Um, and at the minute, the legislation will go through at Westminster that will protect there. We don't have the equivalent, so this is really just bringing that in. Okay. But it's, um, it's by, by no means is it perfect, um, but that's yeah. function of speed. And I suppose 
make the point again, and we have made it a number of times around, it doesn't offer any additional protection to individuals in terms of insolvency due to this, these circumstances. I think, Chair, from what I understand, that's going to have to be legislated for um, separately because of, over the last maybe 10, 12 years, there's been a lot of legislation around um, individual voluntary agreements and so on and so forth. So that legislation itself would have to be changed. I think that's probably... Uh, being considered in the pipeline, um, these are kind of popping up as they can be done quickly. Um, so to have something more expansive, it would also look at individuals. You would have had to amend more legislation, and it would have taken longer. So this is kind of here's the solution for this one, and now we move on to solutions elsewhere. So that's kind of where we are. The talks here just the aim of the permanent measures is to make it easier for companies to restructure in the current climate and going forwards and therefore improve the chances of, of successful rescue. But it sounds reasonable and unmeasured, I think. And it's, it's that, Chair, it's that um, issue of because of the situation we're in, yeah, yeah. Um, if you just maintain the, the normal insolvency and administration, you'll just literally have these companies, as they had difficulties, automatically falling into administration. So this puts a break on that. Um, it's retrospective. It allows um, a lot of the work that would be done um, going into administration where the administrators see if they can save the business. It, it basically stops that happening so that that work can be done before administrators are called in. It gives them a second chance. It, it literally expands that time. It's almost like um, pressing pause mm. at the start of March. And giving this, um, it goes into 2021, giving that time period within which you, you don't just have the normal processes rolling on regardless of the context. Okay. It's, as I say, I'm going to put, my, put my, my head above the parapet and say it's as good as it could be in the time that was available. It's, it's very dense legislation um, and it's very lengthy. As I say, I've never experience having to turn around something so big so fast um, and it's not perfect but it's it hits an awful lot of what it needs to hit um, so and that's not a technical term so members need <laughs> so to if members um, chair if, if 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 we go from the bottom yes. of page seven there and we we go so for the approval the draft, of um, report is at page 11 of your table papers um, do members have any amendments that they would like to propose to the the draft report? Content. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, so are members content with pa paragraphs one hundred or one to eighty seven of the draft report? That's everything, excluding the conclusion. Agreed. Okay. And the conclusions then at paragraph 80 and 89. Which is page... 18, oh no, 28. 28 of the table pack. So it's the two remaining paragraphs as I read out. So um, a conclusion agreeing on the basis of this has been very fast and is not ideal. And also on the basis of there's clearly further engagement needed. Um, going forward and potentially meaning further regulation or changes. Great. Uh, members are content. Okay, thank you. Okay. Moving on then to um, item number eight, which is the LCM on the trade bill. Um, there is a letter from the minister at page 465 of your pack. There is a clerk's memo at page 30 of your table papers. The Trade Bill 2020 at page 42 of the table papers, um, the explanatory notes at page 67 of table papers and the impact assessment at page 93 of the table papers. The Trade Bill was laid in Westminster on the 19th of March. It is a key part of the UK government's independent trade policy following the departure from the EU. The Bill contains measures that will provide continuity and certainty as new trade arrangements and agreements are um, put in place. An LCM is required for part one of the bill and schedules one to three. Um, are members content to ask for a briefing from the department on the bill? Agreed, yeah. And obviously the minister has indicated she's not laying that LCM. No, not yet, but um, the letter she'd sent to the speaker that we have in the pack flagged up and, and considering how quickly 
the insolvency one moved. That was why I thought best to have everything kind of ready. Um, so the memo reflects the bill in a certain amount of detail. Um, what we do now is seek the briefing and if members are content. Now, bearing in mind we've got a bill but we don't have a legislative consent memorandum, but we know the parts of the bill that are going to require legislative consent. So if members are content, what we'll also do is go out to stakeholders and seek views. The, the, the basic premise of the bill is allowing the, the, the third party trade agreements that the EU already had in place. There's a certain number of those, or in fact all of them, that the UK would like to rule on. So this allows that to be done currently in the transition period. It allows the UK government to legislate for that going forward. It will not apply to new trade agreements, so anything that happens with China, Japan, yeah. America, any of those countries where there isn't already an existing treaty with the EU is not covered by this. Mm -hmm. That will require entirely separate and new legislation. This is just attempting to ensure that all the legislative um, pieces are put in place so that those agreements can be what's termed grandfathered, so essentially the, the UK can utilise the existing agreements. Obviously, with the support of the third party, you can't do this if the other side isn't, isn't in agreement. Uh, it also um, clarifies the UK government position in terms of WHO membership, setting up um, particular bodies where there can be arbitration on this and so on. All of that has to be done because it would previously have been done by the EU. So all of those structures need to be set up. So this legislation aims to do that. Um, and the, the aspects of it that are um, required legislative consent are where those agreements would filter down into um, where we would have had locally applied EU directives. So huge number of areas, you know, f fitting into the, I think it's 151 areas where we have uh, a particular specific power within the um, common frameworks. That probably hasn't helped clarify any detail. It's probably just heaped more information. But the, the basic premise is these are required to be put in place to allow those existing agreements with third countries that the EU already has to continue forward. Okay. Again, when we're asking for that briefing, can we get some um, information on how that intersects with the protocol yeah. as well? Yeah. We, um, I didn't put it into this table pack. I, I stopped myself doing that. We've um, commissioned a series of protocol papers. We, we will have six protocol papers. Um, I'm saving those for next pack. Um, and what we will do is it covers the international agreements aspect, so we can go through those. Um, they basically take apart how the protocol impacts on various aspects of things we do, all island electricity market, VAT, tariffs, Mm -hmm. Lots of other interesting things, um, but I thought in terms of what was already in the tabled pack, it might just be worth holding off on those because you don't need to see that just yet. But it will deal with how this intersects and obviously we'll expect um, in the briefing with the department for them to, to clarify that further. So in short... <laughs> <laughs> you know I don't do short. They're bringing forward legislation. To maintain the treaties the EU negotiated for them. Yes. What was the point of leaving the EU? I or couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> two, two it's not one for me. It's one for me. One for me. Freedom, John. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> I think maybe the, the the positive that certainly when I was going through it, I took out of it was that it seems possible to do that. I thought that wasn't something we were necessarily mm -hmm. in a position to take for granted. I was really if the third quite parties agree with us. Yes, yes. To agree to the treaty, they agree on our behalf it's and possible. It. And um, that was that was relatively good news. Good news in a perspective. Yeah. Too close to lunchtime for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll move on then. Item right. number nine on the agenda is an SL on student and fees and mines amendment regulations. Northern Ireland 2020. Um, there was a clerk's memo at page 467 and an SL1 at page 468. 
This statutory rule provides for the annual increases in using the inflationary forecast of 3.1% for the academic year 2021 to 2022, provided by Treasury to the prescribed basic and higher amounts with which higher education institutions in Northern Ireland may charge students who are normally resident here and accepted others. The amendments are made to the regulations annually. The SR is subject to negative resolution but procedure before the Assembly. It's anticipated that the rule will come into operation on the 1st of September 2021. Well, Chair, if I can just sort of interject there. Effectively, what we're doing with this is we're, we're following the normal process. Yeah. The reality is... Not normal. We might not have that. So, essentially, what the Department's doing is bringing at the usual time this piece of legislation, but in terms of what will actually happen in September. Is it September 2021? This is, it's, it's later, it's maybe a couple of months later than we would normally do. No, no, but is it for this September? It should be, yes. Because it says 2021. Yeah, the 21, 22. Well, hang on, that's not this year. 2020, 20. Mm. It should be 2021. That's a misprint. Okay. Is that our misprint or is that a misprint on the... That's our misprint. That's our misprint. No, because I'm sure the regulations themselves actually said 20, <laughs> 20, 20, 20, 20, 2021. Just double check. We're just getting very excited and ahead of ourselves there. But, um, Chair, as I was saying... I, no, it says... Does it say? Mm. It says uh, regulations 2020 and it's due to come into operation on the 1st of September 2021 in the pack. In the well, hi, no, sorry, hang on. That Yes. Is that... Yeah, no, sorry, that is right. It's just it shouldn't have said... That it was the regulations for 22, 21, 22. It's operational. So essentially, it's. Um, I didn't explain it well. Members are aware that the university puts out its application pack sort of now for, for the, the uh, applications at the end of this year. Sorry, that's what I meant. Is the, the fees are set for them, but we don't know if that's actually what's going to happen. We don't know mm. how universities will be operating. We don't know if they're going to have to operate a new business model. So it's speculative, but these are always brought through on a speculative basis. Yeah. Speculative is probably not the right word, but it's the only one I can think of. We're agreed to it, anyhow. But as long as members are content to agree to it, then that's the main thing. But it, it's the same regulation as we get annually. It's just... It, it's. Mm. It's going into a situation we don't necessarily know the context. Okay, but so members are content with the policy implications. Yes, right. Yeah. Too much alcohol based Just, sanitizer. just on that point, uh, I know you're saying speculative isn't the right word, but say we agree to this, uh, and the universities change their business model, which may mean increasing fees for students. Have we tied our hands here? No. Um, this is an SL one, so we now have a period of time before the SR arrives. Once the SR arrives, because it's subject to negative resolution, we have ten. We have our ten plenary sittings, which will take us beyond the summer. So no, not at all. But it also it only provides for the inflationary year on year increase, so it wouldn't permit them to do anything other than what we let. Absolutely, for. it effectively just allows the upgrading of fees by an inflationary amount. It doesn't allow anything beyond that it's it's just the fee so if a new model is brought forward that say for example um says look we're not doing physical um face-to-face -face teaching we're changing our model we're, we're upping our numbers and we're going online for certain courses it'll be online only and we're changing our fee structure that will still allow the increase but the absolute number will have to be re-legislated for. Um, and that's a question um, going forward that at the minute, we honestly don't know. The, the universities, I, su I suspect they're talking now. There was some media attention over a few days this week about um, young people getting letters for courses in particular subject areas where they're being told you, you will be taught online or there will be this provision or there will be that provision. Um, as yet, we've not heard discussion around fees. If, as I say, the universities have already requested the idea of moving or lifting the mass and cap, um, that could happen. Um, if fee structure changes, it could happen if they decide to go more online. All this really does is set up our normal process for year-on-year -year increase, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop anything new from happening, and it certainly doesn't stop the committee from 
changing its mind. Okay. Hence the beauty of, of negative resolution. Okay, so moving on then to number 10, Departmental Consultation and Parental Bereavement Leave and Pay. There is a letter from the Minister and Public Consultation at page 473 and 476. Peter, I presume we're one of those members. We're super consulty on this one, Chair, yeah. Uh, so what we would ask um, the, the Minister to do is, when we talked, this, this was, Minister brought this up in the first briefing she gave the committee way back at the beginning of the session. And um, at that stage, members indicated that they were very supportive of this. So what we might do with um, members' approval is write back to the minister offering the committee support and welcoming the consultation, but indicating the committee reserving its right to act as super consultee. What that will basically mean is once the consultation is finished, the analysis has been done, the department will brief the committee on it, and then the committee can come to a conclusion. Yeah, ground. Um, item number 11 then is correspondence. 11.1, um, there was correspondence from the Committee of Finance on page 507 um, containing a briefing paper on yesterday's budget bill. Yeah. Um, a note. Um, refer members then to correspondence from the Committee for Communities, page 527, raising concerns around the micro business hardship fund, um, which has excluded charities and social enterprise with charitable status. Um, and social enterprises that receive revenue from 60% from trade and goods or, and or services. So we'll forward that on to the department and obviously it's something we've raised ourselves as well. Chair, um, I'm aware um, that the finance minister had briefed the finance committee and indicated, and I'm, I'm always very wary of quoting things I haven't seen myself, but the indication appeared to be that if ministers wanted to uh, look again at funds, um, rework them and rebid that the finance minister was potentially content to look at that. Um, the committee's already written um, or included in a number of letters the idea, including the um, finance minister and the, the first and deputy first minister, the idea of using the um, July monitoring to identify, sorry, June monitoring to identify potential further sources of funding that could then be used to supplement the existing hardship fund, because members had indicated that setting up a separate one was probably going to take too long, um, and then widen out the criteria to include the likes of, of social enterprises, um, the sole traders, the, the big um, high rate paying um, entertainment and leisure. Uh, providers and so on as well. So, manufacturing or, exactly. Uh, yeah. So anyone that fell without yeah. the, the guidelines. Um, and I know certainly personally, um, over the past few days, over the past week, being contacted by lots of sole traders and newly self-employed, and that that's still a big, big bone of contention that those people have no access to to support, um, and many of them aren't able to get included in the self-employed income support scheme. So I think if there's anything that can be done around that, it, it definitely needs to be done. I think that, yeah, Chair, if, if, if that can be recosted and rebid, um, the Finance Minister's indicated he's willing to look at that. Okay. Have you had that in writing, Peter? No, that was, that was a discussion um, uh, with the Finance Clerk. So it's, yeah. at this stage, they're going to write to us and let us know, but I thought just it was... No, it's good. It was appetite at the moment, you know, just to, to flag that up, because it is something that would fit with um, what the committees wanted to do around the hardship fund. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, 11.3 then, there is a response um, from Ian Paisley MP at page 78 around what we were just talking mm -hmm. about earlier in relation to the self-employed income support scheme. Um, any additional things to suggest around that? No. Okay, um, there is a briefing paper at page 532 from the Northern Ireland Union of Supported Employment for the Future, of funding, future funding for Disability Employment. Um, and we will forward that to the department, but Peter, something we might like to revisit as well. Yeah, we're also trying to organise a briefing. Um, yeah, the paper is very clear in setting out um, the problems that have now arisen for the sector because yeah. of COVID-19. Um, and I suppose it's another sector we, we really do need to hear from in terms of trying to make sure what's out there captures as many um, groups as possible. No, so they, they, their case is representative of, a, of an awful lot of, of that supported learning and employment sector. Okay. So we're, we're in the process of trying to organise that now. Um, 
Um, Chair, just on that letter from Ian Paisley, that'll be acknowledged, though, will it? Yeah, we've already done that, Chair. As they come in, um, I automatically go back and thank them and um, acknowledge those. Um, Does all of our correspondence get acknowledged? Oh, no, good question. Yes, um, otherwise we can't organise anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, we... we it, so much comes directly to me, and I just automatically reply. It's, it's, but it's something we have a protocol for anyway. Good. But because I, I emailed the um, letters to the MPs direct, they've all come back to me. So I've been uh, acknowledging those and kind of exchanging pleasantries and so on. So then that issue has been discussed really by us. Oh, very. All the all the MPs that have come back have, have said it's been everyone they could possibly go to. They have been there and, and continue to, to lobby and are advocating the committee continues to raise the issue. Yeah. Brian, thank you. Um, there is correspondence on page 124 of your table papers from Belfast Chamber to the First and Deputy First Minister regarding the safe reopening of non essential retail. Um, so, members, anything to there? Okay. Um, then 11.6 is correspondence page 126 of the table papers from the Rural Community Network regarding unavailability of reliable and affordable broadband and its impact on rural citizens and businesses. Obviously something has been raised a lot of times, yeah, particularly in the um, context of remote absolutely. working. Absolutely. Chair, the, the, um, that has also gone to the um, Dear, yeah, committee and I've spoken to the clerk and indicated that it's an issue we're now flagging up in on the back of other briefings, but particularly what we've heard in the last two days um, around the remote working, the need for um, better broadband across the region, potentially the need to um, bring forward Project Strata much earlier. Well, not the potentially the actual need to bring forward Project Strata much earlier. Um, bidding has, or contract tendering has started. I'm not sure if it's finished, but essentially the process. The minister said something about September, didn't she? That's what I'm thinking. Is the process needs to be, um, Certain. yes, um, basically for these issues and and the fact that so many people now are working from home, yeah. and that's likely to be a feature for months to come. Yeah. Chair, just on that, I had a note there. You know, was it reasonable to ask for another briefing on broadband from the department? Yeah, I think, in, Chair, in response to to these issues, absolutely. We. We've skillfully worked a few empty slots into our very hefty mm -hmm. board work program, um, but that's definitely one I think that's probably worth. It's yeah. really we did have them some time ago, but it was. Days. I think it was a bit rushed at the time. You know, it was a bit. Of well, it was uh, chair was part of a yeah. much more general uh, briefing, well, yeah. Um, yeah. but no, we we'll get them in and uh, tell them all the information we have. Um, okay, thanks. It's just on a connected matter without diluting the importance of that issue on its own. The, the issue of remote working is going to be part of the economic recovery of the new normal, as we talk about. And we've had some discussion on it today. Uh, and I know Ecto uh, said they are bringing out a particular paper on it. The Labour Relations Agency and their work programme, as we mentioned, on it. Uh, I, I would be interested if the committee is interested in terms of delving into that a bit deeper because there's huge opportunities for the economy in that. Uh, there's also challenges, and then we just have to get the balance right in terms of workers' rights and entitlements and around that. So it might be something to look at in more detail, if possible. Yeah, chair, it's it's one of those things now where you know departments are our own assembly, um, businesses are, are having to come up with new. Guidance mm -hmm. so that they're they're protected and covered with people working at home. So there's a whole new world of legislation mm -hmm. required there. Um, and as Mr. O'Dowd says, it's it's been flagged up the last couple of days particularly, but it's a really key part to decentralising work, um, regional balance, where um, you know you you no longer have to have a physical building in a place for people to work in. They can literally remote work. And Anywhere. You know, the finance minister has says that he's looking at how that can be done with the civil service through hubs. Mm -hmm. Is it something that we should maybe look at a, a mini inquiry on, yeah. similar to what mm -hmm. we're doing with the energy? Absolutely. If members strategy. are content, we can start putting that out. Yeah. 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 Just you mentioned the finance minister there, Chair. As part of it, he was talking also in terms of the reduction in congestion in cities, yeah. uh, in terms of improving the environment, etc. So there's there's a number of different elements to it, positive. 
and potentially negative as well. So we just have to look at all those points. I think yeah, that's the, the other thing. Mm. You're right in, in suggesting negative because as, as um, the FinTech envoy was saying, they, they're very conscious of a whole organisation like Allstate mm. getting all their workers out is, is the impact on mental health yeah. and people's need yeah. to you know, be able to still contact, be able to still connect, which is also, again, going back to the LRA guidance on that where they've set out a really good uh, framework of regular sort of video face-to-face -face contact in small groups that aren't just about work or, or you know, almost like trying to socialise over video call in a work context, but that sort of idea. So, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues there. Yeah. I, I would completely support that, but I would see sort of some sort of hybrid model in terms of, you know, it wouldn't be a case of everybody work from home mm -hmm. or, we, it, you know, it's almost a mix. You know, I even, you know, yeah. for example, people travelling, and I use their own example in terms of travelling from the West. <laughs> you know, you're travelling here for a one-hour meeting, but it's a four-hour round trip. It's not good for the environment and it's not good for I don't think for anybody in terms of productivity so I think it support that idea I think it's something that we need to look at Absolutely, yeah there's a lot we can do on that great okay then 11.7 is correspondence from a member of the public regarding early years childcare provision obviously something that has came up in the discussion today um, Peter I suggest we maybe forward that um, to the department but also to the engagement forum and ask yeah. for it to be looked at as part of their kind of recovery plan. I'm sure from the conversation earlier it is, but... Chair, what, what I'll work up as well um, for triaging tomorrow morning is the... I've already done for yesterday's briefing, but the two briefings today, pick up on those points, put them into a memo so that members can have a look. Yeah. And again, probably end up writing to the minister, but just now automatically copy those letters to the LRA yeah, forum. Great. Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> 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 I haven't fallen asleep, I promise. I am in the background. Um, just on health childcare, um, as I said last week uh, to the Minister, I had had a, um, a Zoom call with all the providers in East Antrim, and I'm assuming this is an issue across the country that you are all getting, but I think we are heading for a really difficult economic impact with childcare in the coming weeks or months when we get back to what something looks like normality. They're still being told by whoever, I suppose social services and those that are um, uh, in charge, that the minimum and maximum numbers that any childcare provider can have are 25% of their numbers. So they need 25 to open, they can't have any more than 25%, um, but they need 80% to break even. So it's unsustainable to open. Therefore, there will be no supply of childcare provision for the most part for those parents wanting to go back to work. Secondly, you've got the insurance issue I raised. No supplier of childcare who didn't stay open can get indemnified now, and they're not covered. Um, they're getting different advice in terms of the list of essential workers, depending on which department they contact. And um, there's also the issue about grant support that's available. They're not entitled to any more of it should they've already had their grant. So there's significant issues for this sector, and given that it's a linchpin to the economy, I think we'll all agree that, that in terms of providing care for our workers. If it's not in place in the days, weeks and months ahead, then how can the economy get back to anything like normality? So I think this needs to be something that we, and I know we are, but really need to focus on as much as possible to try and clear away for them to get back to the reopening. Chair, it might be useful to... Um get into a discussion on that for triage tomorrow yeah. in terms of trying to pinpoint useful actions to take forward yeah. um, where the committee can be effective uh, in working with the minister but also conscious of the fact that it, it falls across more than one department yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chair, can I come in there as well, sir? Oh. Um, I'm here too. Um, j just to reiterate the point that um, I um, made last in relation to childcare and childminders around the, the 12 month rate relief. Mm. Given again that most childminders um, work from their own home, they would pay domestic rates rather than non-domestic rates. They're not going to be able to make use 
of 12 month rate relief announced by the finance minister and that also extends to other businesses like guest houses and B&Bs that's particularly in relation to childcare it would be a support that would be welcome um, I understand given the challenges that they faced up to now and also any uh, restrictions that might be put in place because they won't be able to take as many children is it something that we could do as a committee to write to the finance minister recognising the impact on the economy and specific sectors to see if there was a mechanism of being able to provide that rate relief for those properties that paid message rates rather than non-domestic rates? Chair, on the back of discussions last week, the, the committee wrote to the Finance Committee asking them to pursue this um, as a, a major piece of work with the Finance Minister in terms of um, childcare that has been... Chair, I, I'm conscious of the fact you need to take a phone call from the Permanent Secretary. So, um, in allowing you to step out of the room, are members content that an existing member already here in the room takes over as chair? Is anyone wanting to nominate? I propose John, he's a lot of experience. And we're content with that. And those online yeah, are content that Mr O'Dowd takes yeah. over. Perfect, thank you. Mr O'Dowd is now acting chair. He looks <laughs> So, um, Chair, we've already written asking that finance um, take this forward and um, and um, allow um, allow the minister to have a better idea of just exactly where the pressure points are, where the issues are, um, the childcare issues flagged up, but also the issue around um, leisure and uh, entertainment venues with massive rate spills that, that don't get any of the relief. Also, bed and breakfast. So there's a lot of businesses where there's a, a rates issue. Yeah. And as I say, we, we've written to the Finance Committee to ask them to take that forward. You recall there was correspondence from the committee wanting to know where there were opportunities for joint working, and that was a particular one that had been identified. So it's work in hand. But as I say, tomorrow, if members are content to talk more about that childcare issue, there's clearly a lot of angles there that you will have heard from, um, from providers, from employers, from employees and so on, that we need to pick up and, and, and get into more detail. Yeah, is there a way we could, um, I don't know if you're maybe already doing this as a, as a parallel to the department, but could we write to the economy kind of committee too to try and get their members on board? <laughs> Uh, the finance, finance, finance so, well, that's what I mean. we, we've written to them that's who we've written to to ask them to take the, the work forward okay okay Chair, just on the, the rates issue then we've asked about his clarification on who's eligible for the discount yeah uh, the minister mentioned yesterday i think you were there chairman the the, the legislation is required for that to cover those changes and that's where I think, Chair, the um, Finance Minister was saying that any further changes and modifications are going to need to be costed um, and new bids put in for it. But from, from what, I, what I gather, he's open to that. In terms of this, um, you would have to look at the likes of childcare, bed and breakfast, etc., yeah, yeah. where um, try and get a quantum for what that would actually entail in terms of giving rates relief and then make a bid that we put into the the uh, rates relief pot but it's it's doable in that there are lists already of registered childcare um registered b and b's all of those people are already regulated and listed so it's it's doable in terms of matching up lists you could calculate a quantum on that um and that's kind of where we where we've asked the finance committee to go Okay, so we're getting clarification on that. And yeah. Points coverage, Gord? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Okay, Peter, I'm looking at you for direction here. Are we going to move on from this so, point? Yes, if you move on then, Chair, to... Um, if we if we actually just move right on to... Um, any other business? AOB, yes, and then we can adjourn. Have we any other business? Not that we're aware of, Chair. From, we haven't identified. There's none from... The phone. Those in the room, anybody online, any other business? No, Chair. No. Nope. Okay. No, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. So then, just to move then to advise members that the next meeting of the Economy Committee will be held in room 30 in Parliament Buildings at 10am on Monday, the 1st of June? No, it's going to be no. Wednesday. That was wrong, sorry. sorry. Um, we can't do that because it's a plenary day. So it's going to be Wednesday next week, which is the 3rd. So Wednesday the 3rd? Wednesday the 3rd. Same time, same location. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll just bring the meeting to a close then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, John. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.